Story number one, The Bro Fairies. The story may come across as silly or likely a very normal scenario, witnessed under the guise of a drunken young man. So I apologize ahead of time for the length and potential lacking payoff. I moved to California for the first time as a 19-year-old, and less than a few months later, I was 20 when celebrating one of my best friend from college's 21st birthday. We graduated around the same time and got our first industry jobs in the same studio, so for a celebration, all we did was share a bottle of Captain by a crappy apartment pool. We've never laughed more. By the way, I don't condone drinking heavily nor carelessly, but I was a dumb kid. It was an unopened bottle, but the two of us started fading in and out of consciousness way too early on, like second shot early, and realized right away that something was up. Now even though we recognized this, we were both pretty underexperienced with drinking and figured maybe our tolerance was just whack. I remember a handful of blips from before I made it safely back into my apartment. Mindlessly scrolling Tinder, my body just kind of feeling sick and was going to my place and crash on the couch. Me explaining that I was going to go stay outside a bit longer and finally what I refer to as the bro fairies. Three young men, close to my age, in a way reminding me of myself, wearing matching garments of clothing in different colors, tank tops, shorts, and baseball caps. One green, one blue, and one pink. I can't at all recall their faces, but I do remember them helping me up off the ground after I must have blacked out by the pool and helping me up the stairs to my apartment door. They brought me the last of my liquor and said, Thank you, in a sincere, albeit stumbling fashion. My college buddy was passed out on the couch and I stumbled to the bedroom. The next morning I regaled him of the three helpful gentlemen, and he couldn't help but comment how bizarre their description was, and if I was sure I hadn't dreamed it, even though we both blacked out from the alcohol. I know they were very real, and did me a great service. I'm sorry if this is long-winded, but I've always thought back on how helpful they were. And I've since dubbed them my bro fairies. Brother Sends a Message My oldest brother passed away three years ago to cancer. He left behind his wife and child. We were close, but not as much as I wished. We were pretty far apart in age. About a year or so after he died, I had a dream, and I think it was a visitation. In my dream, he called me on the phone, I picked up, and there was silence. I said hello, a bit louder, and I hear this voice, very soft, kind of shy and hesitant. He said my name and verified it was him. In my dream, I was aware this was not real because he was gone. However, I listened because I really wanted to speak to him. Both of my parents are gone, too. I asked him how he was. He said he felt great, better than ever. I asked how mom and dad were, and he said that they were busy chatting to their friends. He laughed and said my mom was very social. He suddenly got serious and asked me to help him. I said, of course. He said he's been trying to reach his wife, but she wasn't answering. Can you please tell her I've been calling? Can you please tell her that I'm always with her? I said, of course. He said he loved me and I woke up. He couldn't believe I remembered everything and how clear the message was. I called his wife and I told her my dream and what he had said and she couldn't even speak. She cried and said, today's her anniversary. I was in shock. There's no way I could have possibly known that. A Woman Doing Laundry In the late 70s or early 80s, my mother, father, sister, and I stayed overnight with some family friends in Lexington, Massachusetts. Although their house was a modern split level built in the 60s, the town of Lexington is quite old by USA standards, having first been settled in 1641. The town has a lot of history, too. 
I awoke in the middle of the night and had to use the bathroom. As I sleepily made my way there, I saw a woman in the corner of the room. Although the room was dark, the woman was clearly visible, as if illuminated by a light source. She was a young woman, maybe in her twenties or thirties. She was wearing a blue and white... I can't pronounce this word. G-I-N-G-H-A-M? Gingham? A white gingham dress with a matching kerchief on her head. She had dark hair, too. She was seated and leaning over her wash tub and was bending over scrubbing and washing clothing. She took no notice of me. Confused and bleary, I had no idea what was going on. The woman was about my mother's age and had the same slim build and brown hair. I said, Mom? The figure faded away and the room was dark. I went to the bathroom and went back to bed and fell up pretty much back to sleep. I wasn't scared, but the incident stuck with me as it was very vivid and unexpected. It kind of felt like it was a glimpse of something that had happened a couple hundred years before. Four Paranormal Encounters at My Grandparents' House The early days of my childhood I always spent going to my grandparents' house for the night every fortnight. The house is very large and spacious. It has an open staircase with no floor above it, so the main room on the top floor essentially has the center of it missing. 1990s. My mother lived there for most of her childhood as well. I never recalled seeing anything strange. Until one night, when she was sat in the living room by herself with the fire going. She may have been tired as she was laid on the sofa at night, but she recalled one thing whispering. She never told me what she was being told. All she knew was that it was coming from the fire, and that the whistling was human or human-like. 2006. This next encounter was from my sister, when she was extremely young. She was at the main hall on the bottom floor of my parents' house with my grandma and grandmother. Excuse me, with my grandma and mother. My grandma and my mother were talking, which possibly would have been boring to a child her age, so she most likely started wandering around as they chatted. However, an extreme enigma was created, as when she entered the dining room, she saw two people sitting on the radiator, a man and a woman wearing modern clothing. My grandmother didn't know these people at all, and her family never knew anyone that these people could have been, so I dubbed them ghosts. 2018, my encounter. This was probably the most reliable and jaw-dropping of the stories. As I was getting ready for bed at my grandparents, I walked over to the bathroom and right next to my room to brush my teeth. As I stood at my doorway, I saw a man in a black suit with no face. He stared at me for enough seconds and seemed translucent, but I just knew it wasn't my imagination as he was there and I tried to imagine him not being there, to which he stayed. After seconds, he disappeared, and I simply thought I was tired and my brain was tricking me. 1970s to 1990s. I never asked the date. The next morning, as I was curious, I asked my grandmother if she had seen any ghosts at the house, to which she responded that one night she came back from a bar early and went straight to bed with the door open. She then described to me seeing a man standing at the door with a black suit, a blank face, and this time, a top hat. The Weird Dreams That Become Reality I'm 21, and since I was a kid, I always suffered from insomnia. And every time I sleep, I have terrible nightmares. Sometimes I dream with things that'll happen in the future, with extreme precision. I used to write about the future in some notes, and when those things happen, I show my friends. They always get scared with the precision of the facts. But the point here isn't that. I'm here to share some of my nightmares with weird creatures, and sometimes they come to reality. I remember that I had a dream that I tried to fight a putrid creature that feeds on sadness and depression. That weird creature 
looks like an old putrid man with pure gray skin, sneaks into the house and attacks you while you're sleeping. This creature can hide anywhere. Doesn't matter the size of the place, somehow he fits there. Two nights after I had this dream, I was alone with my girlfriend watching TV in my room. And then I look at the window, and I saw this creature, but I wasn't dreaming. I just saw it. Thought that I was getting schizophrenic due to the lack of sleep. I was pretending that there was nothing there. Until my girlfriend saw the same creature in the window and starts to scream. I was just telling her to calm down and the creature suddenly disappeared. Just like a smoke in the air. She told me about what she saw. And I had to, basically, I had a note written about the creature. And I'm used to creating histories about my dreams and nightmares. And I create stories about the creatures I see. After that, she got terrified and started to read my little stories and basically just got worse. I have more weird histories to tell about parallel dimensions and some totally vivid dreams, and the things just get weird. If you guys want to see more, tell me before I die. I've been suffering from insomnia and nightmares since I was six years old, and sometimes I see some weird stuff that I can't tell if they're real or not. Due to the lack of sleep and stress, I bet. I'm bleeding from my mouth every day, so I'm dying because of that, but I have a lot of histories to tell before it happens. Weird Little Creatures Playing Beside My Bed I've experienced a lot of paranormal activities in my life. That one happened 15 years ago when I was seven. On the weekend, I used to visit my grandparents. They live in an old house not so far from where I lived that time. I remember that I've heard kids playing a game before I enter at my grandparents' home, so I thought that were my cousins. When I got inside, I saw that none of my cousins were there. I got confused and asked my grandma if she had heard something. She said that it was probably my imagination. I felt okay and didn't ask anything more. Late at night after watching some cartoons with my grandpa, I went to sleep. And when I entered my bedroom, I felt a different sensation. Like I wasn't alone. But I wasn't the kind of kid to get scared easily, so I went to sleep. And then when I was sleeping, I woke up suddenly. I heard children's voices near me, and everything was so dark, I just could see some silhouette of a little-sized person, or whatever it was. They were about 40 centimeters, 1.3 feet tall, and they were running and laughing. I got scared that time, and I've closed my eyes and started to run to the direction of my grandparents' bedroom. I told them what happened, and of course, they didn't believe me. They said that was probably just a dream. I slept with them because I was that scared. On that night, I could hear them from the other room. They were really loud. And the next morning, I told my mother about that. She believed me. She said that it happened to her, too. When she was young, she said that there's some kind of fairy that lived with my grandparents, and that they're somehow trapped there. And also, only kids could see them, by the way. She also said that when she was younger, she used to leave candies to them. So, they don't disturb you to sleep at night. And the other night, I did it, and I haven't heard anything anymore. Experiences I've had since moving to the countryside. Next to my neighborhood, there's a campground just down the main road, and next to it is the foundation to an unfinished abandoned hospital that the town lost funding for its construction back in the 60s. Even further down the road, there's a small cemetery and a church. Services haven't been held in the church since at least the 90s, but the graves are in good condition. During the day, you can find a few rednecks drinking beer and stuff, but it's freaky at night. Not freaky in the sense of being spooky, more like something is truly offsetting about it and the abandoned hospital is completely fine. A few months ago, my siblings and I went on a golf cart ride to the cemetery because we were bored and it was late at night. I kept getting this horrible feeling that something was very, very wrong. 
like something, not a physical being, was screaming at us to leave. Then we noticed there was no sound of wildlife at all, which made them kind of uneasy, but I was freaking out. Then we heard whistling out of nowhere, directly in our ears, almost like someone was directly whistling into them. No one goes to the cemetery at night, and this made them start panicking and made me almost pass out, and needless to say, we drove back home as fast as we could. We all fell asleep on the couch. Later that night, I had a horrible sleep paralysis episode, and I later came to find out that my mom, who knew nothing about the late night activities, also had a sleep paralysis episode that night. We never drove past that graveyard ever again, even during the day. Another one I have is one that I experienced with my two friends, Sam and, or Sam and Haley. We were going to visit another friend, Maddie. This happened around three years ago. She lived at the end of a long stretch of dirt road with about two to three houses on it, and Sam lived in town, just a ways off. The road was on the outskirts of town, not the same one I lived in, but was nearby. I wouldn't even consider it a town, since all it had was literally just a post office and a convenience store. The plan that we had going was that we were going to walk down that road, visit Maddie, and walk back to Sam's house and spend the night. Maddie lived with her abusive dad, and he would have never let us spend the night. It was already a stretch visiting her, but we decided to anyway. We hung out, and after a few hours, Maddie's dad told us to leave. So we did. It was extremely dark out, and we were already kind of put off. We started walking, and all of us slowly began to feel this ever-pervasive sense that something was watching us. Then we heard whispers mixed with the troubled breathing and footsteps. It sounded like something was dragging along the road, and there was multiples of them. We'd all fling our heads back, but there's nothing. And it'd stop for a while, but would come back even louder, almost to the point where it was literally right behind us. We began to feel this sense of pure, raw malice. I don't remember what the time was, but we felt as if we didn't get off that road within five minutes. Something horrible was going to happen. So we all started running as fast as we could. The footsteps began to turn into sprinting and the breathing, and there was more of them. But we quickly made it back into town and walked to Sam's. The rest of the night at Sam's was uneventful. Another thing about that road is that it always felt off, even during the daytime. I had been to Maddie's house before then a couple of times and explored the woods around her house as well. The road always littered with dead animals, either skinned or had big gashes in the middle of them. There'd be a section of the forest that felt extremely off. We found three skinned rabbits laying in the middle of a clearing in the woods in a circle of the rocks. Haley, Sam, and I never went to Maddie's house again, but we still talked to each other, and Maddie moved about five months after that. I looked up the town that both of them lived in and still live in, and the first thing that popped up were numerous articles about the two girls being murdered by a man near the abandoned train tracks around the town. I don't know if the entities drove the man to do it, or if they were already attached to the town before it took place, or if the entities appeared afterwards. Creepy Encounter It's about 1.40 a.m. and I need to run to the bathroom, and as I pass the hallway I glance at the door and it's completely shut. I sit down and from behind me I can hear my mom and my younger brother talking in the front garden. I can't make out what they're saying, being inside. I finish up and wipe. Didn't need to add that bit. But midway through, you, I hear the front door open. I finish and I flush. The door is still open and I think it's a bit odd considering that we have cats and love shooting outside, so I peel around the doorway to see if someone has stood in the doorway. There isn't. I quickly walk outside and I feel the very strong presence of someone walking around the side of the house, so I peel around and again, no one. I get a bit scared and just kind of third back. As I was closing the door, I heard from the other side clear as day a scratchy voice. My mom's voice, in a way that I can only describe as being in pain without water for a week, parched, it was so dry. 
I lock the door in panic and walk into the living room where my mom, who I thought was outside, is fast asleep on the couch. I turn to my older brother and I explain what happens and his face pales. He explains that my younger brother 20 minutes before had heard the same thing. He says that it came from the house and it sounded like a pained, exhausted voice calling to him. It's now two days later and I'm still trying to figure out what it could be. Dad's Goodbye My father died at the age of 72. I had just turned 30. My parents were in their mid-40s when I was born. No small feat for the late 60s. Dad was healthy and active and had the blood pressure and cholesterol of a 25-year-old. He was a World War II vet who enlisted in the Navy illegally at 16, retiring from service at 39 as a chief Botswain's mate. Never heard that term, Chief Boat Swain's mate? One of those two, I hope. He only went to the 8th grade, though my mom helped him get his GED back in the 50s. But he was the wisest, smartest man I knew. He was killed in a freak car accident. He was leaving his home one summer morning in 1999. And he had to turn left onto the highway, looking to the east towards the sunrise. The highway was several bumps and dips, which is probably why he didn't see the massive Ford F-350 bearing down on his 92 Chevy S10. The best we can figure, Dad spotted the Ford and gunned his engine to get across the highway, and the driver of the Ford tried to go in front of him, crossing the highway into the opposing lane. He ended up T-boning my dad's rig, at least 50 miles an hour directly on the driver's side door. His little truck was knocked close to a hundred yards into a field. The tough old SOB had his aorta literally severed among other catastrophic injuries, but still managed to live another six hours before finally giving up the ghost after the surgery. My first words when my brother told me how he died were, that's impossible, Superman can't die in a car wreck, but he did. See, Dad and I would typically talk about once a week. And after the death of my mother, he remarried and moved across the country to where he'd grown up, and I later moved to another state myself. It would typically be Sunday mornings, and we'd chat for 20 minutes or half an hour, whatever was going on in the world. Movies we'd seen, how his beloved Dodgers were doing, that sort of thing. However, the week before he died, he called me three different times all at distinct odd hours. I was on the West Coast and he was on Eastern Time, meaning that there was a three-hour time difference. Yet these calls from him came after 8 p.m. my time, well past the bedtime of a... Ooh, big word. Septuagenarian. Active, healthy or not. In each call, he only spoke for a couple minutes, dispensing with the regular pleasantries to deliver the same message. Son, I just want you to know I love you, I miss you, and I'm proud of you. That was it. The same message three times. I love you, I miss you, and I'm proud of you. He wasn't one of those men who was reticent about sharing his feelings, and he'd often told me and my brothers the same thing. But the timing and nature was so out of character. These talks, unlike our typical ones, lasted just a couple of minutes. And of course, there was the late hour of the calls. Monday afternoon after these conversations, I was on my way home from work. I got a call on my primitive 1999 vintage cell phone from my girlfriend, later to be my wife, telling me as gently that she could that my father had passed. I cried the whole way home and I was shocked, just shocked into the statement about Superman by my brother's call. Yet as I look back, I can only smile. I don't know if Dad knew something, or felt something, or just randomly decided to call his youngest kid a bunch of times to share a message of fatherly love. But it stayed with me as one of his greatest gifts, and one that I try to pass on to my own daughters as much as I can now that they've grown up and moved on themselves. I love you, I miss you, and I'm proud of you.
Story number 10. Someone's at the door. It was around 2009, and my sister was 15 and I was 9. Shut up, Gecko. My mom had dropped her off at a friend's house for a little get-together. While being there, they told me that they decided to invite some more people over. After doing that, they all piled into the bathroom to get ready together. They had shut the bathroom door so the cat wouldn't jump on their makeup on the counter. While in the bathroom, the doorknob had started to jiggle. They laughed it off as they thought someone had arrived early and was playing games with them. Now, my sister wasn't a believer in the paranormal until that night. They opened up the door and no one was there. They shrugged it off and shut the door again. Well, not even a minute after shutting the door, someone started to pound very aggressively on it. Completely freaked out, they locked the door and screamed, Go away! pounding got louder and harder to the point that it was shaking the door. My sister said that her friend was convinced it was somewhat messing with them. So very swiftly, she unlocked and swung open the door. No one was there. Completely freaked out, my sister had called my mom to pick her up. I went with, and when we arrived to get her, she ran into the car crying, telling our mom to get me out of here. She was completely freaked out and didn't say anything else the whole ride home. When we got home, I followed her to her room to ask what was, you know, what was wrong. And that's when she told me what had happened. Now, I didn't believe her at first. I mean, she's my older sister and she likes to play tricks on me. Seeing how freaked out she was, though, and how she never believed in ghosts until this changed my mind. A couple years ago, while driving into town to meet friends, every so often on a long stretch of highway that was semi-secluded, I occasionally would find random objects obstructing my path. Most of the time I could drive past it and didn't think much of it. The last time I saw something in the road, a huge log was blocking my truck from passing, so I stopped and got out of my truck to see if I could move it. Thankfully, another car coming from the other direction also stopped and got out and helped me move it. I talked to the guy for a minute and talked to him about the random shit showing up in the roads when we both heard something in the forest and it spooked us both. It sounded like somebody trying to imitate a wolf or a wild dog howl, so we both got back into our vehicles and sped off. Thank God I wasn't alone because not even a week later somebody I knew came across the same thing in the road. And when he stopped, he was all alone. And after he moved the log out of the road, a tall man in a ski mask was behind him, blocking his way back to the car. The man had a strobe light that blinded him. My friend said he couldn't see what happened next, but he flipped out and booked it down the road a bit till he got to a house and banged on the door to call the police. He left his phone in the car. Turns out, there's a psychopath who lives on this stretch of highway and terrorizes cars and attacks people who gets out. I even heard a story where he jumped on the hood of a young girl's car. The neighbors of this person told my buddy that they had to put up a bigger fence because he set in their lawn on fire a couple times, and the police can't do anything about it because there hasn't been any proof of it leading to him. In short... I don't use that road anymore, and this story is a strong case for why I conceal carry now. Don't blame you. Ask Reddit. When I was 13, I had to go live with one of my older brothers because my dad had passed away and my mom had a nervous breakdown. My brother and his wife were renting a house and it was sketchy from day one. They put me in a room farthest from theirs, and this room was always cold. Heat up on 90, and the register hot enough to burn you when you could exhale and see your breath. Things would just disappear for days and show up in a different spot later on. A couple of times my brother woke up to someone standing in the doorway to his bedroom. But when he would check to see if I was sleepwalking, I was asleep in bed. The door to the room I was in would just not open sometimes. There was always anxiety in the air and you could feel it wasn't right. Just weird feeling shit. Excuse the expletive. The wood paneling in my room had changing patterns. 
Never had a mosquito or a fly or any kind of insect ever in the room, and we're talking a house backed with a swampy bush. My brother got two German shepherds from a friend of his. One was trained for personal protection, so pretty fearless. But still a good dog, friendly to people in the family and used to being in the house. But man, not this house. You couldn't get that dog to enter the house at all. This dog that could take down a full-grown man would whimper and cry like a puppy who didn't know what walking on a leash was. It was surreal, man. This dog was scared of nothing and was strong, real strong. One day we were sitting in the dining room having supper, and all three of us watched a loaf of bread that flew out of the bread box and whacked into the wall across the kitchen. Maybe fifteen feet or so flew straight, level, and fast. The next day, the young man who lived across the road decided to take his life with a rifle to the chest. I was done after that. I told my brother I was going to go somewhere else. I really didn't care where, just somewhere else. There was too much odd shit in that area of three to four houses. I've had other strange things happen when I was younger at my grandma's house, like doors opening by themselves and rocking chairs starting to rock back and forth by themselves. But my grandma always said that the dead won't hurt you. I really believed that, but living in the house was messed up, and I'm 51 now and it's still the most messed up house I've ever been in. Not making this up, everything is the God's honest truth. My TV was possessed. This occurred around 2008. My brothers and I were watching Scary Movie 4 up until late hours of the night on Comedy Central, until I eventually fell asleep. I woke up to a show where a man was sprinting through what appeared to be some sort of concrete shelter. I couldn't see most of his surroundings because it was pitch black dark. All I could see was where his flashlight was shining. I remember the man screaming, Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god! He eventually found himself in a four-way junction. Or maybe a larger room, it's hard to remember. I do remember shadows swiftly moving around the guy and eventually surrounding him. Then I heard something I'll never forget. A loud, high-pitched cackle. It felt like my TV went from a normal volume to its maximum volume immediately. In my bed, I tried to move or leave the room, but was completely paralyzed. I looked around and saw shadows darting across the lower half of the walls by the TV in the corner of the room. Fortunately, I was able to pull the sheets over my head as the cackling continued. After what felt like an eternity, I gained the courage to crawl out of the corner of the bed, hitting the ground. I then crawled to the door, where I saw my dad with a Bible in his hand. I immediately regained my strength and I was able to finally sprint out of the room into our kitchen. Crying, I told him that I thought my older brother was pranking me, which made my dad very angry. However, as he went into the room to turn in the light, I saw him pause. In my life, even now, ten years later, I have never seen my dad frightened, except for this moment. He just stopped. Out of curiosity, I peeked from behind my dad and saw that the TV had the show Family Matters on with the family hugging each other. It wasn't until years later that my dad told me his side of the story. He was reading the Bible in the middle of the night since he couldn't sleep. He heard a TV getting very loud, so he decided to turn it off. When he entered the room, he actually saw two cops in a cop car. One of the cops had no skin, just raw muscle. That cop had a giant grin on his face, turning over to smile at my dad until he saw the Bible in his hand. The cops seemed to immediately become terrified, and then the channel changed. Ask Reddit. I may have written about this in the past, but it's relevant here. I feel like I have a time traveler looking out for me. I've joked around that I became gay and he's my future husband trying to keep me from dying. Maybe he's like a low-stakes terminator sent to protect me. I was the latchkey kid, and this would have been early mid-90s, home alone, made eggs, was watching cartoons. It's probably like 6 or 7 p.m. in the summer, so the sun's still out. 
doorbell rings. I go open it, and it's a black man in running clothes. I only mention his race because there are very few black people where I live. He's younger, I'd say maybe mid-thirties, and in shape. He's jogging in place and politely asking for a glass of water. Well, I'm like seven or eight years old and I invite this man into the house. No one else here. Show him to the kitchen, he grabs a glass, fills it up, guzzles it down. He pauses after drinking, holding the empty glass near his face. He smelled gas from the stove. I must have bumped one of the other burners or something when I made eggs because the stove was leaking gas. He turned the burner off and said the gas was on. He thanked me and left after that. Then another time when I was probably 14, before I could drive, I left my girlfriend's house. It was snowing heavy but calm. About halfway home, the wind really picked up and was basically blizzard conditions, but at no point did I feel like I was in danger. It looked worse than it was, and I was a few minutes from my house. I hear a car horn and there's a car next to me going slow. It's a black man. Again, these rare majestic people where I live. He has his window rolled down and he says, Come on, I'll give you a ride home. I said, No thanks, I'm good. He continued to drive slowly behind me, his eyes darting between me and the road. I didn't feel in danger, I didn't feel like he was pulling anything funny, but what struck me was how familiar he seemed and the tone of his voice made me feel like he knew me. The only reason I declined was because I was trying to be a tough guy. Eventually he goes, Okay, if you're sure you'll be okay. And I said, Yeah, it's not that bad. He drove off. I got home okay, no frostbite. Something pulled me from my bed at night. This happened 15 years ago. I was a college student, lived with my now wife and our dog in one room together with other students in other rooms. My girlfriend had to work one evening and she was coming back around midnight. I've had school next day, so I went to sleep a bit earlier and I was in our room together with our dog. We slept. I was laying on my bed next to the wall, and on my right side was an empty bed place for my girlfriend. Suddenly I woke up. I didn't sleep anymore. I felt the presence of something else in the room. I felt something very dark. I was laying on my back, then opened my eyes, and something threw me from my bed on the floor. I did 180 grade flip, and I was on all fours on the ground. Then I saw in front of me on the floor a huge dark circle and that something wanted me to fall inside, into that dark circle. I didn't see that person, I only saw that dark circle, and I felt the power of something very strong that pulled me from my bed. I thought, this has to be a demon that wants me to fall into hell. I started to scream and cry very loudly, and in that moment came my girlfriend inside into the room. Everything was gone but her dog started to bark exactly on the spot where the dark circle was. He barked about maybe a half an hour and was very excited. This is absolutely true, but was no dream as I can remember everything and I was 100% awake at the time. I didn't do any drugs or alcohol. I've had no bruises and scratches, or rather I've had bruises and scratches on my body. There's no way that I could alone jump from my bed place, laying on my back over one empty bed, and on the end of my, or sorry, and this writing is brutal, and on all fours without help. Sorry, my English. Apology taken. This scared my ass off, and it's only 100% true. Maybe something wanted me to do sins in my life and fall into that hole, which meant hell for me. That was the scariest thing that ever happened. I became very religious after that. Saw my old high school friend. Turns out he passed last December. To give some backstory, this person and I had a few connections while he was still alive. We went to high school together, did a club together for a brief time. And then we did hook up at one point in my very early 20s. We're early 30s now. After that, we hadn't spoken or seen each other for around 10 years, 
although I'm learning that we both had several close connections in life and somehow always managed to just barely miss one another. Wasn't until my oldest daughter needed therapy last year that he re-entered my life. Not in any significant way, but it just shocked me because I sort of forgot he existed. I was unsure if it was actually him, but I just had that feeling in my bones that it was him. He would always pass one, or we would always pass one another, him on his way out and me on my way in, and awkwardly make eye contact without saying anything. The last time I remember seeing him was around February or March. I admit, it's been a few months since I've seen him, but color me shocked when I was scrolling through Facebook on Sunday and saw an old post on a friend's page that spoke about his death. My blood went cold. I couldn't believe it. I still can't believe it. Upon learning of his death, I quickly googled his name and found out the details of his passing. He died late December, five days after his initial accident. So I went to his Facebook page and finally got the nerve to see where he worked. To confirm it was him that I'd been seeing all these months after googling the address, it was confirmed. It was him. Like I said, it's been months since I last saw him but I don't know what to make of seeing him in the halls those few weeks after he passed. I've also come to learn that I saw him 30 minutes before he had a heart attack on the road and sadly never regained consciousness. I don't know all what he was doing that day, but I do know he was at work, heading somewhere, and I don't think it's much of a reach to assume I was probably one of the last few people to see him before his accident. Not sure what to make of it, but... It's been racking my brain for days and my heart hurts for him. The loss of his future and his family. Ask Reddit. Was at my grandpa-in-law's cemetery. I had just gotten into my first huge ever fight with my husband. His grandpa became my father figure in the short time he was in my life. So I went to his grave and I talked to him and told him I was upset and why. I needed help. Our family tradition is to always clean it up, the whole thing. So we bring small plastic shopping bags or trash bags with us to put the trash in. Well, I'm alone and I was headed towards a section that I had, and I sort of just bent over a soldier's grave and I was cleaning it up when I suddenly felt like I was being watched by something evil and negative. I stood up quickly and looked around. Mind you, where his cemetery is, it's nothing but cow fields on three out of four sides. So it's open, open. Well, one side has woods and goes to a person's property. It felt like whatever it was was in those woods. There's nothing there, not even a squirrel. I went back to work on the soldier's grave. I suddenly hear the wind pick up and something run at me from the woods. I spun around quickly and literally felt somebody grabbing my shoulder and telling me everything was going to be okay. And like I was in some force field of a bubble and I was going to keep going, but the voice said, I can't hold this much longer. You have to get out of here. I'm now running back to my car at this point. I get in my car, lock the doors, and turn on my Pandora. And it literally glitched down the playlist to turn on Blackpink's song, See You Later. My grandpa-in-law never said goodbye, but always I'll see you later. Didn't matter if it was on the phone or in person. I sped home and told my husband. It's never happened again, and outside of one person and my husband, no one believes me that this happened. Never have had weird feelings like that again from the cemetery either. We still do clean it. We just cleaned it up back in October after my mother-in-law's funeral was over. Husband's family thought that we were weird. Others were saying that we were super nice. I woke up at 4 a.m. and felt like there was an evil presence in the house. To give some background last night, it was my birthday. My girlfriend and I went to her apartment after some drinks. She has one other roommate who was not there at the time. When we got there, everything was fine, felt like normal. We eventually fall asleep. Recently, I've been having horrible nightmares. 
probably because I'm a little tea break from weed right now. Anyway, this dream I had a girlfriend, and she's not herself. She was rude, judgmental, we were also homeless. At a point in the dream, she grabs my hand almost as if she broke the fourth wall and says, We are not alone, get out. I wake up very distraught. The first thing I notice is the sound of her roommate closing her door. My girlfriend was already awake and it was about 4.30 a.m. I ask her to check her roommate's location because they're close friends. She has access to that. So her roommate turned out to be there and we brushed it off as just getting to work. So we're laying there in silence. That's when I start to notice things a bit odd. Everything was dead silent. The room itself somehow felt and looked different. The shadows and the lighting of the room were strange. Granted, I've never been up at 4.30. It was just different. And this is when I started to really freak out. Every alarm bell in my mind was going off telling me to go outside to get out. The room felt like it was closing in. To try and calm myself down, I ask my girlfriend if she's okay, and she says no. And she says something feels very wrong. I feel like I'm being watched. That statement alone put the fear in me I've never felt. I told her I feel the same way. I get out of bed trying to rationalize what's happening, and I'm thinking maybe it's just a nightmare, and maybe she's just freaking out a bit and we're playing into a narrative because we have some anxiety. My mind was not letting me buy it. My mind saying, no, this is different. You need to leave right now. I go into the living room. The first thing I notice is that it's very hot, very hot. And it's not a shock that we live in a state where it gets very, very hot, but this time it felt like somebody like left the oven on, like heat was generating in the room. Standing in the living room, it felt like I was being watched by someone or something much bigger and evil than me. I rushed back into her room and asked if we should stay at her mom's tonight. My girlfriend was more than happy to, as she was at the verge of crying and said that she wants us to leave right now. We get dressed, grab her cat, get in the car, and drive like hell was behind us. On the way there, we discussed what happened and came to the conclusion that something was definitely very wrong, and it wasn't just one of us. We both felt like we were in danger. I'm trying to rationalize what we felt last night. We're waiting on word back from the roommate to see if she felt anything. Listen, any advice would be appreciated, spiritual or scientific. I want to know what we went through. Did somehow my dream warn me, or did we just freak ourselves out? Whatever I felt last night, though, felt it like it was bigger than any of us. My piece of scientific advice is, please add more periods and commas and such. No offense, sorry. Weird situation would like some opinions. Before I start, I'd like to mention that I don't suffer from any mental disorders that would cause hallucinations. Only borderline personality, which I'm a skeptic about myself. Anyways, I think my parents' house might be haunted. Let me explain. First odd thing I noticed was yesterday morning. As I was about to walk out of my room, I saw what looked like one of my parents' cats clearly moving around in my laundry basket out of the corner of my eye. Now I figured maybe I accidentally locked it in with me when we went to bed last night. And as I look to turn to it, it fades away. Not outright disappearing like a hallucination would, but when I turn to look at it fully, it just kind of faded out of sight. Second thing was today when I was working out in my parents' garage and I see what looks like a dark head peering and moving to my right, then ducking out from behind a pile of junk right in front of me. No corner of my eye crap. I thought maybe some asshole had gotten into my parents' garage and tried to steal my younger brother's motorcycle. So I drop the weights immediately, and I'm in fighting form. Fight or flight response too, I suppose. I go around the pile and look everywhere, and a person could hide, and there's nothing, nobody. For now, that's everything. Now, I need to mention a few things I'm currently living at my parents waiting for the lazy John Howard Society to get back to me about living arrangements. I have a cross hanging around to the left side of my bedpost. 
and this is where I sleep, and I try not to do this at my parents, but because I've been here for over a month, I wasn't able to fully avoid M asterisk 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 patient. <clears throat> and it just recently crossed my mind that maybe I shouldn't be doing that with the cross hanging from my bedpost. I don't know if maybe my mind is going on me and if there's some other explanation for these occurrences, but I'd like to hear what you guys think might be going on. Edit. I forgot to add that about a week ago, just before I was about to head to bed, I heard inaudible, most likely because I wasn't paying attention, because I didn't expect it, whispers in my left ear. My grandmother's house was haunted. For some background, my grandma, Yaya, and grandfather, Papu, must be Greek, bought a ranch home in the suburbs after moving from downtown Detroit in 1969. They were the second owners of the house, and it was built in the 1930s. My Papu passed away in 1981 in the home. My mother has four older siblings, who had all moved out by that time. She stayed living with my yaya until she married with my dad in 1986. Nothing weird ever happened that she can recall from her childhood. My grandparents were Greek immigrants. Huh. They were devoted and orthodox, and there were at least five crosses and icons in every single room of the house. So it always felt like I was in church and I was there. The first time I recall any odd goings on was in the early 2000s. My yaya was in her early 80s at the time and told my mother and I one day, don't tell anyone, but at night before I go to bed, there's people in my bedroom that watch me. Immediately, my mom got concerned that this was a sign of dementia or Alzheimer's. Thankfully, it was not. We attributed it to her glaucoma. In hindsight, that makes no sense. Or that she was in a dreamlike state but not yet asleep. Didn't hear much about anything odd after that. In 2012, my parents separated and my three siblings and mother moved in with my yaya. My sister and I had our own rooms on the first floor, and my mother and brother stayed in the basement. Odd things started to happen. The motion sensor light at the bottom of the basement steps used to go on and off by itself in the middle of the night, according to my brother. The hallway linen closet would be open in the morning, even though it was shut previously. Some banging in my yaya's closet... All a bit weird, but nothing too crazy. One night I had a few friends over, and we were drinking in the basement, when my mom was out and my brother was in, over at my dad's. All of a sudden we heard a loud crash from a downstairs closet, and when we opened it, the metal pole, which had three light jackets hanging on it, was split down the middle. It was odd, because there was nothing in the closet itself that would have fallen to make that sort of banging sound. I let it go, and I didn't think of it. In March of 2015, my yaya sadly passed away at the age of 95. She passed in her bedroom. We knew she was going to go soon, and before we went to bed, my siblings, mom, and I prayed over her. At about 2 a.m., I woke up out of sleep and to somebody saying, Get up. And when I went into her room, she was gone. Maybe it was a dream. I don't know, but I was thinking about it. It just freaks me out. After her death, things went haywire. One night, my sister and I were watching television in the living room. It was probably 10.30 p.m. I went to the kitchen to get something to eat. The light from the TV was bright enough that I could easily find my way back to the kitchen. I looked at the back door because I felt odd. That's really the only way I could describe it. The back door had a peephole, and the light in the backyard was automatically set to turn off at 11 p.m., Normally you could see the light shining through the peephole, but I didn't. As I adjusted my eyes, I saw a large black shadow standing at the landing in front of the back door. I froze and turned my head and closed my eyes. When I opened them again, it was gone. Needless to say, after that, I felt extremely uncomfortable in the home. Prior to this, I never had any real paranormal experience. I was on the phone with my mom and simultaneously pulling into the driveway of the house. We were finishing up our conversation when I looked at the front door. It was the kind of screen door that had a white bottom and then a window that would have begun about waist height of a six-foot adult male. 
What I saw was my mom kneeling in front of the door, so I only saw her eyes and her curly black hair peeking over the bottom of the window. As I was still on the phone with her, I said, Mom, what are you doing? Stand up. And she told me that she wasn't home and would be there in a few minutes. Again, I froze, shut my eyes, and when I opened them, the eyes and curly black hair were gone. I told her I wasn't going to the house until she came home and she didn't even ask why. When she pulled in, I told her what I saw and she said, Honey, I was hoping none of you would see her. She went on to explain that since Yaya passed, a small girl with black curly hair and a red dress would often appear in her bedroom downstairs. She gave one specific example. She was watching TV on her laptop late at night, looked up and saw her standing in the middle of the room with a big smile on her face. All my mom said was, hello, looked back at the TV and then she was gone. I guess this was their typical interaction. Things like the cellar door would open. I would latch it, come back down to retrieve my laundry and it would be open again. The banging on the closet doors got worse. The microwave door and oven drawer would be left open. If we called my mom's phone, it would often sound like static gurgling if she was in the house. The worst of it happened one night, about two weeks before we were to move out of the house. We sold it roughly five months after my yaya died. My siblings, mother, and I were sitting in the dining room laughing and having a couple of drinks. Without saying a word to each other, we all went silent the air in the room got heavy and it felt like the oxygen was sucked out of it. All of a sudden, we heard an ungodly wailing from the basement. The only way I can describe it is a mountain lion yelling. This was accompanied by stomping up and down the stairs. I hide under the table with my ears covered, my sister sat still, and my little brother cried. And my mom, the absolute badass she is, runs down the stairs and screamed, In the name of Jesus Christ, get the f*** out of my house! We were all absolutely terrified, beyond terrified. That night we all slept in my room together. My mom, my brother, slept in the living room until we moved out. Nothing too crazy happened after that night in the two remaining weeks that we lived there. It's been eight years since, and we occasionally talk about it. My mom's siblings don't believe it because they never had any strange goings on in the time that they lived there. I sometimes wonder if the new residents have had anything happen. They haven't sold the house yet, at least. Since then, my family has not experienced any type of paranormal goings-on, but god damn, I do not want to live in a haunted house again. Don't blame you. My ghost is an asshole. My house haunted or has some kind of spirit attached to it. I even saw it one day. It was between my house and the old church next door. Thing is, I was walking between them and it walked strangely and it was very hunched. As I got to the end of my yard, it looked up at me and this thing had zero facial features. I was not impressed. Just saw it the once though. Here's our activity sitting in my room with the Roku remotes on the chair besides me. My TV started switching between apps on the Roku and was even picking them from the home screen. It was weird as fuck. My little sister and I were hanging out in the basement because that's where her room is. And there was a cup sitting on the table and as I'm sitting on the chair, I sort of talk to her and it flies across the room like somebody threw it. We were both silent for a couple of minutes and then she told me she finally believed me that there maybe was a haunting. Fast forward to this morning. I'm sitting in my chair but the window smoking a cig. My dog is laying on my bed sleeping per usual. I don't have a dresser. I have a shelving unit I put folded clothes on. As I'm smoking my cigarette, admiring the beauty outside her house, I hear a loud crash. I look over and my entire shelving unit had fallen to the ground, as if somebody had pushed it. Yes, it was put together properly and has been holding up well since I purchased it five years ago. At first, I didn't mind the ghost. It played a few other tricks like hiding things from us and sounding like the children are playing in nobody's home, calling our names when no one else is around or awake and stuff like changing channels or throwing cups. It clearly wants to make itself known. 
I think I'll use the law of dominion. So if it's bad, it can go away. If it isn't, I guess it can enjoy fucking up my house in the afterlife. ETA. My niece just told me a few days ago that she made a PB&J and left it on a plate in the stove while she did something else. She came back and the plate was on the floor. Nobody had been in the kitchen. She was here with me at home, and I just hide in my room. Greetings, believers in the extraordinary from Paranormal M. Prepare to question everything as you subscribe and enable notifications to keep up with our latest mind-bending stories. Enjoy the mystery. Roundabout Ghost This happened only like an hour ago. So I'm a graveyard manager at a casino in my small town. Right outside the casino, there's a roundabout. And it's had several accidents over the two years it's been here. We've been pretty dead tonight due to a thick fog, so I went out to check the parking lot and get a bit of fresh air. As I was getting ready to go back, I looked out the roundabout and I saw someone standing in the centerpiece of the roundabout staring up at the road in the neighboring town. I thought that this was odd as it's like 2 a.m. and foggier than Silent Hill, so I called out to the person to see if they were in trouble. Got no response. I then looked at my phone for like half a second and when I looked up they were just gone. This kind of weirded me out a bit as there's no way they could just disappear at that point as even with the fog I could make out the body and clothes but looking back on it I never did see a face. Just last summer we had an accident where a trucker lost control of his rig and came barreling down the same road the figure was staring at and ended up killing two people in a car in the roundabout so I'm wondering if there's a connection there. The little casino I work at is haunted. I work grave shift at a little casino in a small town and everyone's had something spooky happen at one point. It's pretty common to hear your name called, both the staff and the guest. Have it happen, it's kind of unnerving during grave. When you only have one other person working and almost no guests. We call the ghost Charlie, and he's pretty peaceful, calling names and sometimes screwing with the bathroom doors. Recently though, it feels like something else is there, and I see shadow people darting around the machine sometimes. It gets pretty cold when this happens, and it feels different from Charlie, so I doubt this is him. It is possible for another ghost to just show up, and I have a lot of paranormal stuff happen in my life, but this just started like a month ago with the shadow people. Anyway, I just wanted to share this and see if anyone had any insight or had any other workplace ghost stories. One of my many encounters. This one is mild. In third grade, I went to the Whaley House, which is considered the most haunted place in America. I had no idea it was haunted otherwise. I'd never have gone. Been quote-unquote sick that day or whatever, you know. So I pointed at a woman tending the garden. She was on the more pale side, and I thought I could almost see through her. I wondered why that was. I raised my hand and I said, Is she okay? She looks kind of sick. The teacher said, Stop playing games. I said, I'm serious. She's right there, working on her garden. My mother said if I read about it, I wouldn't have come. Then asked if I was messing around and I said no. My teacher accused me of stirring up trouble and sarcastically asked what she looked like. The tour guide's face went white. They asked if I had been there or read anything. I said, No, why is everybody being mean to me? I had described Anna Whaley to a T, who was sometimes seen tending her garden. I fucking lost it and burst into tears as the teacher reprimanded me for hunt sort of hurting the other kids. My mom was there and grabbed my hand and said that she believed me and that I needed to leave. My mom was a chaperone. 
So she called my dad who rushed over while the kids were with the teacher and she brought me one of those swirly rainbow lollipops. It is terrifying to be yelled at by a teacher as well as being told you see something scary. I applaud my parents for backing me up. And who the fuck takes third graders to the Whaley house? A few of my more minor experiences, I have too many to count. The other day I was playing Dungeons and Dragons. I was rolling for a saving throw so my character wouldn't die. Right as I was about to say, I failed it, my dice that had just stopped rolling for 30 seconds rolled over to the side. From I think like 9, it just barely failed, it rolled to 15. My DM thought I was fucking around. Safe bet, to be honest. Then I saw my reaction over Discord, so I saved and we won, still dumbfounded. I was cooking something and the oven fan turned on randomly. I was like, hey, kinda coming in clutch, you know? Then something pushed my laptop and a bunch of magazines really hard off the counter and threw a teapot across the room. I was like, oh shit, I need some sleep until my mom asked me why I didn't clean up from the night before and why the tea kettle was in the middle of the living room. This one is the big boy, the most unsettling. It used to be every night, but now not as much. I'm asleep. When my door opens, the doorway is foggy and there's an orange and red light flashing in the background. In walks one of the best-looking men I've ever seen, he wore a simple but classy black three-piece suit. His black hair is slicked back. He has a fantastic face and ice blue, almost gray eyes. He walks in and I can't move. He stands over me, just looking at me for a few seconds, before leaning down and kissing me on the head. Then he says, I'll see you soon enough, before leaving and closing the door gently. In each of these situations, I've tried to find other reasons and no, there aren't any. One of my many encounters with the paranormal. Today I was telling my friend about how on a school field trip outside of a haunted house, who the fuck takes third graders there, and about how I saw something like a woman or something but I just remember being yelled at for seeing stuff that wasn't there and upsetting other children, quote-unquote. For those listening, I believe this is a, a... Sid the same post from the same person, but perhaps elsewhere. What my mom said was that there was a cemetery nearby that they wanted us to go into. I kept saying no because she wanted me to hold her hand and I didn't want to. They were like, who? And apparently the description looked like a child buried there that had died from some illness. I was losing it and getting in trouble. My teacher said I already read about it and wanted to make a fuss. My mom was there and said, if she had read about it, she wouldn't have come. Fast forward probably like over a decade, I finally set foot in that cemetery. I immediately walk over to the tree in there, and it had names because that's fucked. As I was looking, I had my hands at my sides and... What felt like a little child's hand started holding my right hand. As stereotypical as it sounds, the hand was colder than the normal air. When it disappears, I turn to my right, and there's a child's grave, with flowers, candles, toys, a little girl. I realized today that she did end up holding my hand. They make good stories, but it's scary to have these interactions and see, feel, and hear stuff. It makes your blood run cold, or maybe my mama just raised a bitch and... It isn't that scary. I don't know what he is, but he definitely wasn't human. I work in retail, seen a lot of shit. There was this man that walked in and I got a chill and my chest tightened. I got frequent panic attacks, but it was different. He was bad news. Of course, he approaches me out of everybody else. The conversation went like this. 
me trying not to throw up. Hi, can I help you? Him staring at me with a terrifying huge smile. I need help with my phone. Me. Actually, all I can do is make you an appointment. So he says okay, and I make him an appointment. I hate working with him, and I want to run to the back. He is with his wife, who's normal, and I got good vibes from. Lady, run. She could become a skeleton in his closet. He was evil. Still makes me nervous and feel like I'm being watched. I just freaked myself the fuck out. I tell him to have a nice day, and he said, Thanks, you too. So I laughed and said I couldn't tell if he was being sarcastic. He looked me in the eyes. Eyes are literally the windows to the soul for me. I look in someone's eyes and I see their darkest secrets. Any emotions they felt in the past, their thought process, and since past trauma. I know it sounds fucking insane. Also intentions. I thought it was normal. But when I found out it wasn't and my grandma said I had the gift... I was like, no, I don't. That's not possible. I figured I was just really observant or something, but no. I say shit I had no way of knowing about strangers. I feel like they're lying despite feeling genuine shock from them. I don't guess numbers and shit, but I know what people have been through. Strangers. Once I look into their eyes, I got tested for schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders at least five times. They call it an active imagination, but it's accurate. Always more on than later if you got questions. Behind those eyes was evil and hate, nauseated me, gave me goosebumps and a shiver on a hot day. His smile got bigger and he said, You know when you ask someone if they're being sarcastic? Nice men, like me, get angry. I don't know how I was calm on the outside. That felt somehow like a threat. I said goodbye and walked calmly to the back of the store and then had a full-blown panic attack. They aren't uncommon, but I never had, like, customers be that blunt. I've only genuinely given a fuck about two of them in my entire time in retail, so this was a big deal. He scared the shit out of me. My manager sent me home because I kept throwing up, not like that was uncommon, as I was kind of bulimic, but... Never have I at work or in public bathrooms, as I'm a huge germaphobe. But before they had said a man asked for me, I refused to help him. Normally I'm trying to get a raise, and unless they make me feel unsafe, we'll try to help the customer. They sent my friend who's 6'3 and ripped and protective as fuck over me. He said he got really bad vibes too. He did the guy that gave me the tech help but not on the same level. My friend who had just gotten off work saw me and he walked me in my car because I was not laughing or cracking jokes, but I was completely serious for once and it scared him. I'm like the equivalent of the class clown in the store. I'm normally the comedic relief in tight situations. As the eye thing tells me how to make people feel certain emotions, like happiness and make them laugh. Bad ones as well, but I've rarely tapped into them. I'm depressed, so I want to keep others from feeling like me. At the same time, I have a general disdain for other people. I know a weird combo. I care about other people, but I don't want to be around them or interact with them. Being around them is exhausting, because whenever I look into somebody's eyes, it's like an insight check in D&D. I have no control over when to do it makes people think I'm not paying attention, but I can't pay attention and look somebody in the eyes. But I couldn't look away. I was stuck looking into those evil eyes. This was not just the average dislike I have for people. This man was bad fucking news. His smile seemed too big to me and was more menacing, like a dog bearing... I don't know how it's spelled. I'm dyslexic. Yeah, baring its teeth at you. You spelled it right, ma'am. He didn't feel human. His wife was lovely and a sweetheart. She was normal and had a beautiful, genuine smile. She was oblivious to him. Can't explain it. Other people saw a normal smile and human eyes. But I know what I saw. His eyes looked normal, but were not human. His smile was too big. 
haven't told anyone because it would freak the people that believe in this stuff out, or they wouldn't believe me. I figure people on this sub would understand. I'm not sure what he is, but he sure as fuck isn't human. I hope his wife is okay. She was so sweet. The Glowing Lady, a boy and his father. The story is about the glowing lady. When I was around 10 or 11, I stayed over at a friend's house and we were feeling a little bit rebellious, so we decided to go outside past midnight because we thought that was cool for some reason. Anyway, my friend and I left his house and went on to the open street in the neighborhood. And at the end of his street, there was this old house no one lived in for a long time. It just sat there pretty much the whole time I lived there. So we looked toward that house and we saw a lady in a white dress. And since it was so long ago, I can't really remember a lot of the details, but I do remember her glowing really bright like car headlights pointed at us. Since it was so bright, I couldn't see her face, but I knew it was a woman and that she had this dress on. She started coming towards us. So me and my friend being kids said to each other, run. She's going to get us. We laughed it off and ran inside his house. And I got the idea to check out the window to see if she was still coming and she was gone and that was it. We just got on the PlayStation and forgot all about it. Now, years later, when I'm nearing 17 years old, me and my family go pay a visit to the old friends and the neighborhood. And when we reached the end of that street where the old house was, I jokingly said, nobody ever lives in that house. And my mom tells me, well, yeah, because people have told me a long time ago a woman that used to live there was having a wedding and her husband never showed up and left her. Then she came home, killed her kids in the bathroom and killed herself. And everything clicked in my brain and I just froze. This second story is about a boy and his father. My mother has this friend we'll call her Beth, that had all these stories about this guy and his son that she sees in her home from time to time. Nobody believes when she tells them that she's constantly telling my mom that she just wishes somebody else would see them. Anyway, she described both of them as wearing a plain white t-shirt and blue jeans. But the odd thing was, they both have no head, like it stops at their shoulders. But she said that she sees them but they just stand still and look in her direction. She wakes up and sees them, or they'd just be vibing in her house, and she told my mom that they don't scare her, because they just stand there, and understandably, it was probably their home before hers. Moving along, one day a friend of Beth comes over for dinner. Beth tells her that she has to use the restroom, so she goes and takes care of that. And when she gets back to her friend on the couch, the friend says to Beth, I thought your husband gets off in an hour. Beth says, well, he does. And the friend says, well, I just saw him walk to the back bedroom and I said hi, and he just kept walking and didn't answer me. Beth realizes what just happened, and she starts clapping out of excitement and asks, what was he wearing? And her friend says, a white shirt and blue jeans. And Beth gets excited and says, yes, finally, somebody else finally saw him because she was starting to think maybe she was just going a little bit crazy. In conclusion, one day Beth finally says, I'm tired of this. I understand you once lived here, but this is my house now and you can no longer stay here. And then she stopped seeing them. Unforeseen Creatures when I was 12 years old in about 2013, I moved to this old house, built in about the 1940s. No one had lived in this house in over 30 years, and it was the first fall I've seen at this house. I was taking trash out to our back porch, and from there I could see a tree line that's normally very green and hard to see through, but seeing how it's fall and the leaves are almost all fallen. As I walk out to take trash out, I look at the tree line, 
about 30 or 40 yards away, and I see four to five of these at least seven-foot-tall pure white humanoids with no faces. I stand there in awe, not knowing what to think. It honestly looks like they're talking with hand gestures, but I couldn't hear anything. Now that I think of it, I heard nothing at the time. No birds, bugs, or even trees moving with visibly moving branches. I screamed, hey, to which the creatures became motionless, like a statue. Then I proceeded to ask, who are you? To which I stand there for a second before the creatures dispersed. Now I could see far into the woods, and they all went their separate way, not even hearing a leaf or twig crack when they fled. They quote-unquote ran off so quick that it seemed like a blur. To be honest, after that I completely forgot about that experience, until later that night. As I said, I was young, and at this time my mom worked night shift, and wasn't there for when I screamed at these creatures. FYI, I lived on essentially farmland, but my neighbors could easily walk up my driveway in a matter of two to three minutes. So later that night around 9 p.m. I heard knocking on my back door, the one where it leads to the back porch where the creatures were. And I thought maybe my mom told the neighbors to check up on me, so I go check it out. I go to the back door, turn the back porch light on, and open it to where no one was there. Casually, I chalked it up to maybe one of my dogs hitting the door or something around it. Now after this knocking kept coming from the door, and it was weird, because every time I rounded the door to where I could see the back door, the knocking stopped. Now this happened a few more times every few minutes, ranging from when I turned my back from the door to when the moment I sit back on my bed, to just waiting five to ten minutes before it happened again. After about an hour of this and increasing anxiety, I got fed up and I went outside to scream, I don't know who you are, but you better stop. And to my surprise, it did for about 30 minutes. Then knocking came from around the house, on windows, doors, and walls from the outside for about another 30 minutes. I was scared curled in the corner of my bed. After the 30 minutes, there was one last bang beside my window that I felt like shook the house and was shocked that the window didn't break from it. That was the end of it. Nothing for the rest of the five years I lived. At least, I lived there. The shocking part was the outside was old, as stated, and could honestly be broken with one good swing to the exterior. But where that final bang was, there was no sign of any impact. Honestly, I think that's what scared me the most. That this creature could full force shake my house and leave no damage. I lived in Tennessee, by the way, if this maybe helps figure out what this thing is. He was friendly. Many years ago, when I was 12, my parents got divorced. After I moved in with my mom into her new house. The house was bought from an elderly couple who couldn't live alone anymore, due to the age, and were sort of heading to a nursing home. At settlement, once all the paperwork was signed and T's crossed and I's dotted, the elderly couple casually brings up, just so you know, we think our son Daniel is still in the house and has never left. Now, it's unclear if he died in the house or just came back to stay with his elderly parents. My mom was totally sketched out by this. Fast forward a few weeks. The second floor was completely unfinished. My older brother was in trade high school at the time for a senior project, and his project was to frame out the second floor. One night, while there by himself, he was working with the bedroom door closed and his music speaker on when he saw the handle do about a half turn and the door very slowly open about a quarter way. He ran out of the house and had my other brother come pick him up. This was the first experience. About six months later, he was in a bad car crash and was lucky to be alive. After many surgeries and time in the ICU, he was sent home to recover and was in bed and wheelchair for an additional six months with very limited movement. 
He and his friends have many stories of what sounded like silverware dropping into the metal kitchen sink, or frisbee just rolling across the room, but nothing ever violent. Now for my experience. You need to know the basic layout of my house first. On the first floor, there were two hallways, and this formed a big L shape. My room was at the end of the short leg of the L, and the kitchen was at the end of the long leg of the L. Standing at the island in the kitchen gave you a perfect view directly down the long hallway to the intersection of where both hallways met. At that intersection was the bedroom door to my mom's room. There was also a pretty bright hall light at the intersection. One night, I was in a video game binge in my room. Honestly, I'd say five straight hours of playing without getting out of my chair, not even going to the bathroom. While playing, I saw something out of the corner of my eye in the intersection of the two hallways. It looked like a moving shadow and pretty tall. I looked over and after a few seconds I dismissed it as being a cat. The height discrepancy didn't make sense, but I wasn't too worried. I started playing again and a minute later I saw movement again. This time I stopped and looked a bit longer, focused on where I saw movement. Nothing. I go back to playing for a few minutes and I can see movement again. No way this is my cat at this point, and this time I won't break my line of sight from the hallway. All of a sudden I hear my mom saying, Kyle, Kyle, where are you going? She comes walking down the long hallway from the kitchen and turns toward her room, but the door was closed, as she always left it. She looked confused, turned around and surprisingly saw me sitting in the chair in my bedroom. She asked, did you just go into my room? It's just so weird, we both saw the same shadow in the same spot at the same time. And over the next years, we had so many small, unexplained sounds, thumps, or out of the corner of our eyes, sightings. He was never violent, thankfully, or vocal, but it was always an ominous feeling. However, my mom was very unbothered by him and used to openly talk to him and just ask him how he was doing. I guess to be friendly with him. One day, my mom decided to try and help him. She said out loud, Daniel? I'm going to where your parents went. If you want to see them, come with us in the car. We then got ready and got into the car. The nursing home where they went after they sold the house was only five minute drive from our house. My mom announced every turn and road name. I'm making a left onto so-and-so road. Turn by turn, she gave directions out loud. And when we got to the nursing home, she said, This is where they are, but I don't know what room they're in. We waited a minute and headed back home. We never really saw anything definitive again. Please help. I think I saw a ghost. Today it was a sunny day. Around 15 to 16 hours, I was talking with my girlfriend. She was on the middle of the sofa with her phone on her hand watching Instagram. On the sofa's back, there's a wall, and on the sofa's right, there's another wall, but with a door. Out of nowhere on that door, I see many white, thin smokes slowly moving from the left to the right for around two seconds until disappearing. I stop the conversation and in a serious way tell my girlfriend that there's a ghost on the door. She keeps looking at me, not taking me seriously. And then the white smoke comes back. I tell her to look, but this time it moves from the right to the left and lasts around one second. This is when she looks and it's not there anymore. It was like the smoke you see from incense. Soft, thin, but in a large quantity. I thought maybe it was my girlfriend's phone, but its light wasn't hitting the door. I checked the lamps nearby, I checked the zone near the door and saw nothing. I even thought about spider webs, but none of these move. I'm scared, guys. This isn't my first paranormal situation. Around seven years, I saw a huge, white, glowy aura moving slowly on my parents' room, more than one meter long, and my brain shut off until I realized what I'd seen. Guys, should I worry? Is this the right subreddit? Part of me is happy my girlfriend didn't see it. I'd rather think it was a hallucination than a ghost.
Ask Reddit. When I moved out at 18, I got my first apartment with my ex. It was a relatively large complex and we were in the middle level. Lucky 13. We had just gotten married and we were having a lot of problems. I chalked it up to my rushing into one bad situation to avoid another. Long story. But there was something weird about the apartment that seemed to bring out the worst in us. We fought a lot and my ex was both physically and mentally abusive. I was staying up during the night so we could spend time together and sleeping during the day when he was at work. Because we fought so much, many of these nights would be spent in the living room alone surfing the internet while he would be in the bedroom playing games or sleeping. The layout of the apartment was like this. Slightly different. Oh, it says this and this is a link, but I can't show you the link, so... Anyhow, moving on. Slightly different, but we didn't have as big of a back bathroom, but that's the same layout. We had a computer desk set up in the corner of the living room, and sitting at the desk meant your back was to the small T-shaped hallway leading to the back bathroom and spare bedroom. This is important. The back bathroom always gave me the creeps. I couldn't go back there without feeling an overwhelming sense of dread. There was a small built-in wall shelf behind the door in the back bathroom. And there was a hole in the wall that reminded me of Silent Hill. Because every time I'd see that hole, it seemed to get bigger. During many of those nights when I'd be up along the computer, I'd be browsing the internet, reading things like creepypasta, watching movies, playing games. I've always been sensitive to supernatural things. Scary stuff I can't explain, if you will. I've been so scared I was literally immobilized with fear before, and I've had visual hallucinations at night many times. There was one instance that really sticks out in my mind. I don't know if it was a dream, a hallucination, or what. I was sitting at my computer desk in the dead of night reading something. But it was like the point of view was switching between myself looking at the computer and that of like a dome camera in the corner of the room watching myself at the computer and the room behind me. I'm scrolling, then the point of view switches, and I'm watching myself. I see myself scrolling, and I've got my chin resting on my hand. I can see that I'm reading something. The entire room is in view behind me, and I can see the kitchen and dining area behind me as well, and the T-shaped hallway leading to the back bedroom and bathroom. I'm just watching myself. And then I see a shadowy figure drift up the hallway and stop behind me. That's literally just behind my left shoulder. I'm watching from the aerial point of view and I can see this figure is just resting there behind me, just over my shoulder, as if trying to read what's on my screen. It switches back to my point of view. I feel tense and cold. And then I get that weird feeling like something's watching me. And then go to turn around. The point of view switches back to Ariel and I see the figure bolt down the hallway before I can turn around and see it. The point of view switches back to my own and I'm now aware of what just happened. I'm looking behind me and nothing's there. I got all, just turned on all the lights in the house and then went to the master bedroom, locked the door and laid in bed. The next thing I remember is waking up the next morning when my ex went to work. It wasn't until after that we finally moved out that I told him about the experience, and he shared with me about how the apartment as a whole made him uncomfortable, and just mad all the time for no reason. I still don't even know if what I remember was real or just some weird dream. I still get uncomfortable thinking about that apartment, all the weird shit that used to happen there. Ask Reddit. When I was younger, I used to take naps upstairs, but by the time I was eight years old, I absolutely refused to go upstairs. The upstairs had two large closets or attics. They ran from one side of the upstairs all the way to the other side on both sides. It was essentially a crawl space that was maybe 30 feet long started one day when a friend and I went crawling from one side to the other with flashlights, like kids normally do. Then I saw a girl sitting there in the corner acting like she wanted to play with us. 
I know a lot of people say when they see a ghost they aren't scared, just interested, but nope, I was beyond terrified. This girl looked normal, had blonde hair and nice dress and seemed friendly. I stayed silent, kept crawling behind my friend and got out of the closet. Told him what I saw in there. He said he didn't see it, but felt like he didn't want to go back in. Then my parents would occasionally send me upstairs to get something. And when I would go up there, I would see the doors swing open, as if they were trying to get me to come inside. I would lose toys and wouldn't be able to find them anywhere. Suddenly, my parents would be fishing out Christmas presents out of the attic and we would find some of my toys in there. I remember being eight years old. My parents are asleep still in the morning and I leashed up my dog to go take on the monster in the attic. My dog, usually up for anything, refused to go off to the top step into the attic. My parents never believed me with all the weird things that happened in that house. I would get blamed for things that happened all over the house, leaving lights on, toys all over, things I knew I didn't do. Well, anyway, we moved out of there when I'm ten. Not a week passes before the new owner calls us up and asks if the house is haunted. Their daughter sleeps upstairs, and she says that she's been playing with a blonde-haired girl at night. My parents laughed at how crazy these new homeowners must be. To make an already long story short, the girl started appearing in other parts of the house for them. They kept in contact. They would look over while watching TV and see the girl sitting on their daughter's lap. They looked up on the computer the past owners of the house, found an old dressmaker that lived there, and yep, a picture of the little girl wearing one of the lady's dresses. The family that moved in there were absolutely torn apart by the events. Got divorced, dad stayed living in the house, and ended up taking his own life in that house. The guy who died at the convenience store. I started working there in the 90s. Shortly before that, the owner's son was working, and a man rushed in to ask for a knife. He'd been in a car accident, and his girlfriend couldn't get her seatbelt off. Owner's son turned around to grab the bagel knife, and by the time he'd turned back, the dude was dead on the floor. His seatbelt had done something to his esophagus, crushed it, I believe. And while adrenaline helped, he suffocated and died right there at the register. I did not know this when I started working there. I found out after I asked about the things I was experiencing. Bird, you're sounding like a car backing up. I found out after I asked the things that I was experiencing, and I'd get kicked or poked in the leg or shoulder while nobody was behind me. I'd walk through cold patches that moved throughout the store, see the reflection of someone in the cooler door but turn to see nobody there. Felt like I was being watched while I was in the cooler filling sodas. But the knife, the bagel knife, while working by myself on camera with nobody else there, that knife would be gone the minute I turned around, and then I'd find it back a bit later, maybe somewhere else. The other staff said similar things were happening to them. The overnight shift was one person, and often the store was empty. The people who worked that shift heard whistling sometimes, but mostly they heard crying. Turns out the girlfriend was a teacher at my high school. Started talking to him while I worked. I let him know that she was okay, she survived, and he can let it go. And things started to calm down. I stopped getting poked, the knife stayed where I left it. Definitely the most intense experience I've ever had. My brother died in jail. Trigger warning for drug use. Noted. My brother was in solitary while in jail. He had a dental visit with the jail nurse and he was awaiting trial on misdemeanor marijuana charges, and he was 25. He was someone with no concept of consequences, and he absolutely hated authority. When he went to prison at 18, he was told to clean the bathroom. He put the sponges on his hands and knees and just sort of crawled around just to irritate the corrections officers. 
I was in high school while he was in prison, and he wrote me a letter. If I died, would Les Max cry? I hope so. And that his teachers would ask where the students saw themselves in ten years, he said, I don't see myself in ten years. His parole didn't go well, so he finished his five years. It was just a multitude of misdemeanors. Then he got a job and happily worked double shifts at a gas station. They loved his work ethic. When the guy he was living with got a girlfriend, she wanted my brother out. So he found some grease ball to live with. Then the drug bust came. My brother was caught up in it over marijuana. As he was awaiting his appearance before the court, he had his dental visit. And he'd been caught making hooch in his cell. He was put into the only cell with no camera. When you're in solitary, you get one hour a day to shower and clean your cell, under supervision. If you need something like shampoo, you submit a written request. If you're lucky, you get it, eventually. He was known for whistling, tapping, and drumming while in a solitary cell. 11.20 p.m., he asks for the aerosol cleaner. A corrections officer gave it to him. His rig was a rag with a toilet paper holder, and he'd written on his clothes, you should delete yourself as a message to the corrections officers because he despised them so much. Around 2 a.m. the aerosol can hit the floor, and the guy in the cell next door started yelling for help. He was dead already, but they called my mother to tell him that he was in critical condition at the hospital. He was on a gurney in the hallway covered by a sheet. She just was called to identify his body. The officer who gave him the cleaner was not reprimanded, but when they mailed him, or mailed his stuff to us, they included the rag in the toilet paper holder. They offered to send us the video of them dragging him out of his cell and doing CPR. The friend's husband started working at that jail as a corrections officer. He said, Every night, the same whistling, tapping, and drumming kept happening. Everybody heard it. People would ask, Who's that blonde guy walking around? Several years after his death, his driver's license was found on the floor of the correction officer's storage room. I started finding pennies right away after he died. I was having dreams where I told him, You died. He didn't believe me. Then eventually they changed. I'd be excited to see him. And then I'd say goodbye again. And finally in a dream he told me he was ready to go. I still mourn, and this was over 20 years ago, but I'm still mourning, and occasionally I still find pennies. Got a good ghost story? I love a good ghost story. Let's hear yours. I've got a few, but here's a moderate one from a few years ago. I was staying at my buddy's house in Massachusetts. Right near her house is a famous old abandoned mental hospital. Naturally, we went trespassing in daylight to check it out. There were lots of buildings on this site. It was like a whole campus. Of course, the buildings were falling apart and boarded up and covered in spray paint. Some windows were boarded up, some had glass still. Some were just giant cutouts where the windows used to be. Some windows had been milky, white, thick plastic coverings too. Anyway, we went upstairs and this one building, we saw old beds and hospital-like equipment. Then we went back down the stairs to the exit. And we went to go explore the rest of the campus. My friend was walking in front of me and her friend was behind me. It was just us three girls walking in a line and I was in the middle. We were walking against the building that we were just in, about a foot or two from beside the building. And it's an empty window. It's just basically all empty window openings, rather. The first two windows were openings in the walls. They were not covered, but you could see through into the building. But the third window was shielded in white, mostly opaque plastic wrap. My friend walked by first. Nothing unusual occurred, though. But as I was passing by the window, a forceful finger came through from behind the plastic wrap to poke me in the face. It didn't make full contact, However, it came close about an inch or two from my cheek. And oh yes, 
one could audibly hear the plastic getting manipulated while the poke was in contact with it. All I said was, Whoa! And the girl behind me witnessed it. She said, I saw that. Craziest thing to ever happen to me, and I live in Baltimore. So living in Baltimore, there's a place called Lock Raven Reservoir, and it's out in the sticks. Quick to get to, though. Baltimore's kind of weird like that. Ten minutes one way, woods ten, then next the ghetto. So we would drive out to Lock Raven and smoke while driving the empty country roads. Well, on those roads is a turnoff to a park. Been a while, but I'm kind of sure it's Cromwell Park. And it's not the kind of park you think. It's more just woods with trails, and you can only get there by driving. Roads way too small and dangerous to walk. Well, me and my friend went there one night to smoke. It was about 1 a.m. and we parked in the parking lot, which again is just a few spots for cars made from gravel. In front, behind, and to the right are trees leading to nothing but more woods. To the left, I'm driving by the way, it's a field. The field goes a little more than a football field, and I would say maybe a football field wide, till you guessed it, more trees. Yes, very good. So we have a CD case, and I was breaking the butt up and while my friend prepared the blunt. It's pretty dark out, except for some moon and starlight shining, and I just look to my left and on the edge of the field where the trees start. I see what appears to be someone with a flashlight. It's far away, so I'm not worried about it. Just say something to my friend like, what the fuck is somebody doing in the woods all the way out here at this time? I continue breaking up the bud, and when I'm done, I pass it over to my friend, and he dumps it in the blunt roll and kind of just lays the CD in the dash. While I'm waiting, I look up to my left again, and now the lights are up in a tree. Not real high, just a few feet. So I comment again. Why the fuck is somebody climbing trees at this time in the middle of nowhere? He's just like, if I know. Then he starts to hear some pops going off. Now I'm like, uh, okay, he's lighting fireworks off. So weird. The pops keep happening more and more. I had no idea that all hell was about to break loose. I'm looking over there and a flash of light turns off and the pops keep going. For some reason I had thought that, and when I thought, or rather, for some reason I had a thought, and when I thought it was my stomach, got that scared feeling, sorry the writing's crazy, I got that scared feeling and I said out loud to my friend, getting goosebumps thinking about this, why can't we see fireworks going off? At that exact moment, the explosion got super loud and traveled across the field towards us, like a string of explosions coming right at us. It made it across the field in probably three or four seconds. The car was engulfed in explosions. I could feel them in my guts like fireworks do. The CD case vibrates off the dash and they're going off like crazy. My friend who's been through some stuff in his life, his mom stabbed his dad up in his sleep while he was in the room next to a 13 year old, so he's not easy to scare. He's in tears, freaking out, begging me to leave, absolutely pleading. I'm saying, no, I wanna know what the fuck is happening. I turned my car back on because I felt bad for this clown in tears and was gonna leave. But it all stopped as soon as the car turned on. I remember him saying it sounded like a stampede of horses going around the car. The area had fights from the Revolutionary War and redcoats and bluecoats in that area. It was known for being sympathetic to the redcoats and battles being fought in the area. Can't say that's what it was, if it was a ghost or what, just saying that's what came to mind. I emailed the park ten or so years later and asked if anyone has ever said anything about anything paranormal to, to them before. They said no. Not one thing ever. To this day I'm left perplexed at what the fuck happened that night. It's mind blowing. I thought only movies had this kind of stuff, but since then I'm way more open minded. I still believe a lot of people lie and are just crazy. I hear stories on here where you think, bro, come on, 
you're full of it, or you need help. But this is what happened to me, believe it or not, and I don't care. But it's the only thing to happen to me. Felt the urge to tell someone. Paranormal event while watching paranormal activity. When Paranormal Activity first came out on DVD, I watched it at my friend's apartment. She lived in an independent living portion of an orphanage. I've always loved ghost and haunting movies, and that one really freaked me out. But the freakiest part happened at the end of the movie. I was pretty unnerved by the end of the movie, and after the end scene, the credits started to roll. However, they were not normal credits that you can read. The names were flying by so quickly on the screen that they are just kind of a blur. My friend and I thought that was really strange, so she paused it so we could read the names. When she paused it, the screen showed a ton of tiny names, like 200 of them, and every single name was my first name with a different last name. My blood ran cold and I got chills all over. I could think of no rational explanation for why every single name on the screen was my own. Surely there couldn't have been 200 of my name working on this film. And for all the names to be grouped together instead of separated by their role on the film, it was strange. When we pressed play again, all of a sudden the credits were rolling normally. I've watched the movie since then and the credits were normal happened just that one time. Needless to say, I stayed at her apartment that night because I did not want to be alone. Felt like some entity was singing, just kind of singling me out. I was pretty freaked out and feeling on edge. Later on, I hear stories about how the orphanage she was staying at was haunted. Met my guardian angel. I was raised Christian, but somewhere along the way I decided I couldn't buy into it without real evidence. It all seemed very suspect that we were just supposed to believe because of faith. So I considered myself agnostic. I couldn't presume to know either way if God or paranormal things existed, so I didn't really think about it and went on with life. Anyway, that's the mind frame I was at at 19 years old, when I went to a rave with my boyfriend at the time. I had been drinking, and we had an argument that pissed me off, so I went to sit in the car by myself until he was ready to leave. I was aware of my surroundings, and I didn't pass out. I had never drank to the point of blacking out, ever. I sat in the passenger seat and remembered the CD I was playing. I hadn't been sitting there long when my passenger door opened and someone crouched down and put their hand on my leg. What struck me is that I didn't feel threatened at all. This person didn't knock first, just opened the door and bent down to touch me like they knew me and knew I wouldn't be afraid. When I looked at this person I got the impression it was a female, but then I wasn't sure, maybe it was a feminine male, it was unclear. They looked androgynous with short, dark hair, and even though I was looking directly into their face, I can't remember any of their features. I just get the impression of a light figure dressed in dark clothes with dark hair, but a peaceful presence. I wasn't scared. They said, are you okay? I said, yeah, I'm fine. Who are you? Did my boyfriend send you? And they said, no, he didn't. My name's Star. I don't know how to go about explaining who I am. I said, okay, well, can you try? They said, no, I just came to check on you if you're okay. I must be going now. I asked them to stay, but they shook their head and said that they had to go. At this point, I had to come to think I was speaking to a woman. So she closed the door, and I watched her walk off in the rearview mirror. A little while later, my boyfriend gets in the car. I ask him, did he send that woman to check on me? He asked who I was talking about. I explained the interaction and he said that he'd been watching the car the entire time as I was sitting in it and nobody came to the car. In fact, the doors were locked and he had to unlock them to get in. 
He was shocked because the experience had seemed so visceral and real. He was raised Catholic and told me that angels were often described as featureless and androgynous the way I had described them. Like looking into a bright light, but it didn't hurt my eyes. I scoffed at first, but then realized I had no better explanation. Ever since that night, I've been convinced I met my guardian angel. I know how crazy that sounds, but it was so real and I don't know how to explain it otherwise. I'm positive I didn't black out. Has anyone had a similar experience? Stars Dancing in the Sky A few nights ago I was out late at night with my family and some friends. It's really smoky out and I looked up and noticed a relatively bright star in the sky. About like Vega in brightness. I'm into astronomy so I looked at it for a while trying to see if I could identify it with my star app on my cell phone. And that's when I noticed a couple of odd things. The star was moving, not in a straight line like a satellite or an airplane. It was staying in its same little patch of sky, but it was moving in a random pattern and at random speeds. Sometimes very slow, sometimes it would stop, sometimes it would shoot very fast. It wasn't wiggling a little bit like atmospheric distortion, it was moving a significant distance. I pointed it out to the people I was with and we all agreed that we saw it move. Also it wasn't appearing on my star map. The other people I were with identified three additional lights doing the same thing. Also in the sky there were normal stars that weren't moving and not as bright. After watching for a good long time I realized that they were also pulsing light seemingly at random. It would flash slightly and illuminate the clouds around it, so it was inside the clouds. Sometimes only a quarter would flash. Sometimes it would light up the clouds around it all the way around. I watched them for about an hour until it was time to leave, and then drove an hour away. They weren't in the sky at my house, only at the location we originally saw them. This is the second time I've seen something like this, but this is the first time that I had a whole crowd with me to acknowledge what I was seeing and watch with me. I think I have a cursed rock. Me and my girlfriend love going to castles and exploring. We live in the UK and had an English heritage pass, so we'd go to a few castles when we could. June or July last year we go and visit Beeston Castle. It's a fantastic castle on a hill and there's a whole knights tournament taking place. We sat on a wall at the bottom of the hill and noticed a rock was loose. My girlfriend laughs and says that we should put it in our pocket as a memento. I had cargo shorts on, so laughed about it and put it in the pocket where I forgot about it. Until we got home. We had a lovely day until we leave. She starts to feel unwell and on the way was sick, so I had to pull over. She has a rough week before going to the doctors and finding out her kidneys are failing. This was an issue that she suffered with in the past, but for over a year had no issues. She made a recovery after about a month. We went on holiday in September and while away my granddad had a fall and banged his head. He healed up before I returned but has bad knees and needs surgery which keeps getting pushed back. My car broke in October and was taken off the road as the engine broke and couldn't be reasonably replaced. Still without a car having to borrow my mum's until I could afford a new one. November comes and my girlfriend's mom, who has a number of long-term health conditions, gets sepsis and is in the hospital where she nearly dies and a DNR is placed on her by the doctor. She does come out after making a recovery, but has had several more stints in the hospital through this year. Each one of them she has a time where she can't breathe and is close to death. My nan has had cancer for a while and finishes her radiotherapy in December. All seems to go fine, but is told near Christmas that it didn't work out and the cancels or sorry, and the cancer is basically now all over the body. 
She's still fighting and on medication, but it seems nothing will clear the cancer. January and our cat gets hit by a car and dies. We had him less than 12 months. February and my girlfriend's grandma is unwell and dies on Valentine's Day. March and April, our dog gets unwell and has to be put down. May and June, her nan is unwell with cancer and dies after a short battle. July, my mom is now unwell and her muscles wearing away after drastically losing weight and not being able to eat much. She's been diagnosed with liver thrombosis, but having loads of tests to see what else. She has a lot of falls, can't make it upstairs all the time, and needs a bit of care, which my dad struggles with as he has spinal problems. Also, my granddad is admitted to the hospital as he has a long-term blood infection. He has no idea how he got it. This is prolonging his surgery again. And this morning, my mom's car goes in for a service, an MOT, and it fails with the timing belt needing replacing. They haven't gotten one, so it could be weeks. I need transport for work, so trying to arrange a courtesy car. We also are waiting for money for my girlfriend's grandma's house sale to come through as we're going to be given some money for a car, but last night we were told that this too is delayed. That sounds like a series of more than bad luck, sir. Good evening and welcome back to Paranormal M. Help us work the algorithm by dropping a comment below, respond to stories, or leave your own sixth sense on the matter. Your narrator enjoys reading your comments, good or bad. Get ready for a journey of awe and wonder, something that's bothered me since I was a kid. In the 90s, I was in my younger years, you could say. I remember this day specifically for two reasons. One, I'd finally saved enough pocket money to go get Hungry Hungry Hippos. And two, what I'm about to tell you. So it was a warm and sunny day, sometime in the late 90s. I'd finally saved enough money to get Hungry Hungry Hippos. My mom was talking me to get it soon. She said that she had to do some ironing. So I follow her upstairs and I sat on her bed. Waffling nonsense, as most kids do. When the house phone rings downstairs. Mental, I know. Telephones attached to the wall. Christ, I'm old. So am I. So she puts the iron down and goes downstairs. I'm sat there yammering away to myself when I look to the left, and there was a black shadow-like figure, quite tall with red eyes, looking at me through the bedroom window. I absolutely shit a brick, got goosebumps typing this out. So I jumped underneath my mom's quilt on her bed and waited for her to come back upstairs, absolutely sweating my back out. She came up and it was like nothing had happened. I'm still quite confused about this to this day, and I've just turned 30. It was so clear though, I could clearly see it just staring at me. I will say as well the house that we were in was originally incredibly haunted. I've got many a story from being a child, but this is one of the ones that lingers. Something strange happened to me, and I'm looking for answers. Not safe for work warning. You've been warned. I had something that's been bothering me, and it happened recently. To start off, I look for any possible explanations and everything, but I'm not really finding one here. Two nights ago, I was sleeping when I heard my best friend's voice talking to me, and it woke me up. As soon as I heard her, I immediately woke up and I looked at the corner of the room where I saw a figure. Since I was half asleep, I assumed it was her because I had heard her voice wake me up just seconds before. I flat out asked it my name twice. I'm going to change her name and I'm going to change it to Sam. So, Sam, Sam? When I asked whatever I saw if it was my best friend by name, it started to disappear. 
At that time, I assumed maybe my eyes were just adjusting and I was still pretty tired and went back to bed. When I woke up in the morning, I started thinking about how weird it really was, so I decided to tell my brother about it. As I'm telling my brother, both our front door and screen door open and shut like somebody was coming in. Mind you, they were completely shut moments before. We both looked at each other and was like, yeah, that was definitely weird just now. I decided to sleep with my lamps on at night just because I was a little spooked. At one point I woke up to use the bathroom and I realized my lamp was turned off, even though I had specifically left it on. I was also the last one awake, so no one came in here and turned it off after I fell asleep, as if they were already asleep themselves. This one can be explained, though, as it might have turned the lamp off, or maybe I might have turned the lamp off and not remembered. However, it's still weird when taking everything else into account. Back to what originally started this, the figure. This is driving me absolutely nuts because at the moment it didn't occur to me how weird it would have been for my best friend to be standing in the corner watching me sleep, and instead, I accepted it as normal and even asked if it was her. And here's the thing. It wasn't because it didn't even look like her, it was simply a figure. Just a dark figure with barely any characteristics. When I asked the figure if it was the name of my friend, I was filled with an unsettling feeling of, like, split-second fear. For the slight second in that moment, I was scared that when I asked if it was my friend, it was going to step out and reveal itself as something else. But instead, it started disappearing. Phew. Weird Encounter in California A little bit of background. I was driving from Washington to California in 2021 to visit my grandfather. I had a little red Honda with 200,000 plus miles on her. Good little car. Anyways, I'm driving through one of the national forests in the late night hour looking for a place to park my car and sleep. I was pretty low on cash, so I figured almost anything would work. I see a sign that looks perfect. Campground up ahead to the right half mile. I turn down the first right turn that I come across and make my way down the road. It's a really rough road, but I figure some campgrounds work like that. Go about a mile down the road and realize this is probably not the campground road, but a logging road or something. There's a small clearing to the left of the roadway, and I figured it was just as good as anything else. So I parked my car and killed the lights. I had left my blankets and pillow in the trunk of my car, so I got out to retrieve them. I noticed that I can hear my heart beating regularly, loudly, and I don't question it. I continued collecting my things, and a thought ran across my mind. That's not my heartbeat. I don't know what I was hearing, but my mind flooded with fear and adrenaline and I got back into my car as fast as I could. Scared at first, I just listened because I thought the heartbeat could have been footsteps from a very large something. Then I got the idea to turn on my headlights. I could see nothing around, hear nothing around. The headlights were facing the opposite way of the direction I assumed the noise to be coming from but with brake lights on, I saw nothing. While I started to wonder whether I had heard anything at all, I had blanket and pillow, shut off car, and was so tired I decided to try and lay down. This lasted less than two minutes. All of my senses were telling me to leave, so I did. Made it back to the highway, took a right turn back onto it, and found the campground shortly after. This part has nothing to do with the story, other than being what happened between when I went back to see if I could find footprints. When I reached the campground, there was a group partying that started shouting at me and asking if I was Roy. They were loud and sounded to be having a good time. I said no, but they couldn't really hear me, so I just drove a bit further and found a place to sleep. 
after trying to sleep for a bit, but the noise being loud, I had tried just walking up to hang out with them, but got scared and went back to the car. I fell asleep and go back the next day to the clearing on whatever road to see if I could find footprints. Nothing. No heartbeat sound. A ghost led me to my family tomb. This happened in early July. I was on a trip with my wife and mother-in-law through the United Kingdom, and we had a few days in Edinburgh to take in the sights. Now I knew that my family was originally from Scotland, but I wasn't sure where. Edinburgh seemed a pretty safe bet, though since that's where J.K. Rowling is from, and my last name, while rather uncommon, is incredibly similar to a minor character in the Harry Potter books. We had heard that she took inspiration for a number of characters' names from headstones that she found in local kirkyards, cemeteries. So we decided to take a look for ourselves to see if we could find anything. Long story short, we did. Early one evening, we visited St. Cuthbert's, Cuthbert's, excuse me, St. Cuthbert's Kirkyard near Edinburgh Castle. By random chance, we arrived just as the paranormal bus tour was leaving. The tour group were all lined up by the bus, but the tour guide was walking alone through the Kirkyard to meet them. Clearly not one to miss the opportunity to spook some out-of-towners as we crossed paths. He told us to be on the lookout for a little ghost of a little six-year-old. He said she likes to tug on people's jackets, which we took as an opportunity to make a few predictable jokes to scare each other once we were on our own. So we walked around the graveyard for a bit talking about the various names that we saw, and I made a point to mention that if we did see any of my ancestors, the spelling might be different. After some time, I felt a small hand hold mine. My wife has pretty small hands, but she was standing to the other side of me, and this was smaller, childlike. There was no chill in the air, no eerie feeling that I was being watched, just a small child's hand reaching out and holding onto mine. I didn't say anything out loud because my mother-in-law is very religious, and I'm already on thin ice with her over some of my political stances so it seemed best to keep my mouth shut about an ongoing paranormal encounter. So there I was, walking through a graveyard with my wife on my left, my mother-in-law behind me, and an invisible child holding my hand as we looked at the tombstones. I was completely silent. I wasn't afraid, though. This ghost seemed kind of friendly, and people say I have kid magic, so I figured, hey, this kid probably just wanted to hold my hand and take a stroll. It wouldn't be so out of the ordinary had the child in question been somebody I knew and, well, alive, but I digress. I slowed my pace to make it easier for the kid to keep up. I have long legs and people say I walk fast, which caused me to fall behind a little as my wife went on ahead. Mother-in-law was reading the headstones carefully, causing her to fall even further behind and I realized I didn't want to split up our group, so I looked ahead and called out to my wife. I was going to walk over to her, but the hand pulled back on me. I kept my eyes on my wife and told her to wait up for us, and the hand started tugging towards the right side of the path, slightly behind me. It wasn't violent. It felt more like a kid trying to get me to look at something. I was still facing forward when I heard my mother-in-law's voice from behind me on the right side of the path. Is this what you're looking for? I turned around and sure enough, she was standing in front of a large headstone engraved with my family name. About a dozen of my ancestors were directly beneath us and a ghostly child's hand was trying to show me where they were. I paused and took in the experience. It was incredible and I felt a deep sense of gratitude. After spending some time there, the grip on my hand loosened slightly, but it didn't let go. We continued on our journey and found myself swinging my right arm involuntarily to a slightly different rhythm than my own stride. If you've ever handhelds, or excuse me, 
If you've ever held hands with a small child while they're skipping rather than walking, you know what this kind of feels like. After a short walk, though, the swinging stopped, and I felt my hand released. There was a slight brushing feeling as the spectral hand took leave of my own, and when I looked in the direction that it might lead, I saw I was standing in front of the grave with the girl's name. She died at six years old in the early 19th century. For the life of me, I can't remember the name on that headstone, but if I saw it, I would know it right away. And if I ever return to Edinburgh, I'll make sure to bring her flowers to thank her for showing me around. My Childhood Home My family lived in this home from the mid-70s into the 90s. The house always had a creepy feel to my brother and I. So many strange things happened there. Toilets flushing at night, stereo coming on. My brother and I were terrified of the basement for some reason. My mom would send us down there to get a loaf of bread out of the freezer, and you never saw a kid race up and down stairs quicker. Nothing unusual happened in the house according to the oldest members of the neighborhood. One Saturday morning, I got my bowl of Fruit Loops and plopped down in front of the TV to watch Bugs Bunny. Everyone else was asleep. I could hear the chair that was 12 feet behind me moving. It was a regular 1970s living room chair, but it was on a base that allowed it to swivel side to side or rock back and forth. I assumed my cat had just jumped up to sit in the chair, as he often did. But moments later, my cat came in and sat by me and the chair kept rocking. A few spoonfuls of cereal later, and it was rocking so hard I could tell the wooden base was coming off the floor. My brother and I had done that from time to time because we were dorks. I was too scared to turn around to look at it. Oddly enough, the night before, my family and I watched a 60-minute special about a haunted house. The people told the ghost that they wanted to be friends with it, then the scary interaction stopped, and there were only a few mischievous events after that. So I repeated their speech as best as I could remember it. The chair stopped moving. I went back to bed, still not looking at the chair, and tried to go back to sleep. All the strange events stopped, but the house never lost the creepy vibe. Haunted Building in Denver This is my dad's story from the late 1970s, but I'll write it out as if I'm him. I've heard the story so many times it's easier to just transcribe it from memory instead of retelling it, if that makes sense. I worked for a building maintenance company, HVAC, plumbing, electrical. We had a customer with a problem building in downtown Denver that had chronic intermittent issues. I'm pretty sure the building goes by the name of the XYZ building, but he can't remember the name now. Only that it was right across from the Denver Mint and next to a hotel. We had been called out to this building three days in a row that week and couldn't make a repair because it was always fine when we were there. I can't remember what this problem was, but it's immaterial to the story. This customer was really putting pressure on my boss that we had to fix whatever the problem was immediately. And the boss was mad that he couldn't bill anything out yet. So we decided to let the three of us who ran the unproductive service calls there and just spend the night there to figure it out. Great. The building engineer was always a crazy son of a bitch. The man had his way of fixing things and we had ours. He used very crude materials, and he had horrible worksmanship on his fixes. We fixed things the proper way so that everything was up to code. Needless to say, it was usually his repairs that failed. For example, I was called out once to fix an ice machine. I found it was rigged with rubber bands and paper clips when the thermostat needed to be replaced. The building manager asked me if I found the problem, so I showed him how I found the machine and explained how it should be fixed. 
The building engineer also showed up, yelling. I told them it wouldn't work. They're always doing these shoddy repairs. They should be fired. When we got to the building for our overnight adventure, a maintenance worker told us that the engineer had died at his desk in the mechanical room a few days before. We were a little relieved, or <laughs> we were a little relieved to hear that we wouldn't have to deal with the bastard. We got to the mechanical room, set up our cots to prepare for the night, and double-checked that we all brought our tools in with us, because we were going to be locked in for the night. We were sitting there joking around about what we expected to find wrong with the building, and one of the guys noticed the building's engineer's sweater was still in its usual place over the back of his chair. The guys working with me absolutely hated him and threw the sweater on the ground and stomped on it because the building engineer was always such a jerk. Shortly after that, we were making rounds and all the electrical to the building went out. Yet, against all logic, we noticed the elevators were somehow in use. We could tell the elevator was a couple of floors above us by looking at the floor indicator. I'm thinking this was some kind of open floor plan multi-floor department store office at the time. When the doors opened, we heard the elevator settle a bit, like a significant weight just got into the elevator. It went down a floor, still a floor above us, and we heard the doors open, and it sounded like a single person got off the elevator, walked a few paces in the store office, and got back into the elevator. Our floor was next, and we assumed people were up to no good, ended up locking the building with us, so we ran back to the mechanical room so that way we could grab something to defend ourselves with. I grabbed my twenty-two that I always kept in my tool bag, and the two other guys with me grabbed knives or big wrenches, not sure which. On our way back to the spot by the elevators, pipes just started bursting everywhere. I ran to find the main shutoff valve, and after I turned it off, I was back at the spot where we stood before the pipes burst. I looked around for the broken pipes. We found two broken peoples down two different corridors. Shortly after I finished welding mine, I believe that they autocorrected pipes to peoples, so I'm going to rephrase that. We found two broken pipes down two different corridors. Shortly after I finished welding mine, the plumber yelled, Damn it, Jim! I told you to stop messing around! Then I saw the guy running towards me, pale as a ghost. He asked if I had just grabbed his leg when he was on the ladder. I hadn't, nor had the other guy that was with us. The welder said that he figured out when he turned around after welding the pipe where it had broken. He waved his torch and didn't see anyone else in the corridor with him. That was enough for the two guys who were working with me. They unlocked the doors and left. They were nephews of my boss, so they could do things like that and not really worry about losing their jobs. I wasn't related to the boss and had to support a whole family, so I locked the doors behind them again and went back to the mechanical room to get some rest if possible. As I laid on my cot with my twenty-two, I heard the elevators going up and down all night long, but way faster than a normal elevator. I could hear what sounded like people running on the floor above me. I planned to just stay in the mechanical room hidden in the basement until the morning when the manager came in. Then I could go home. I noticed it felt a little chilly in the mechanical room, so I checked out the boiler. Definitely cold. The pilot light was out. I didn't smell a bunch of gas, so I just struck a match and relit it. The entire boiler exploded. I ended up with severe burns to my face and arms and never went in that building again. My addition to the story that we lived in Colorado Springs at the time. We knew my dad was working overnight in Denver and expected to see him first thing the next morning. His boss brought him home the next afternoon and both of his arms and his face were covered in white bandages. That morning, I drew a picture that I said was of my dad, with white, fluffy arms. Singapore Ghost Stories Chalet Incident 
This incident took place recently in 2023 when I stayed in a chalet with my family for one night. This chalet is not in Shanghai or Basir Reis and nowhere near the east side of Singapore. Not going to disclose the location either. There were a few villas that we could choose, but we picked just the normal villa since it's just for one night. We reached there around 1 p.m., and to be honest, I already felt weird. The villa that was given to us was far from the other villas, and it was beside this forested area. For some weird reason, my grandma immediately said this when we arrived. If anything you see or hear, don't say anything. Even though it was weird to me, it sort of was normal for a Malay or Malay families to say this because we don't want to attract the attention of those things. We started to decorate the chalet for my sister's birthday party, setting up the balloons and unpacking our things. At about 4 p.m., some of our cousins started coming for the party, and my mom realized that we don't have enough ice for all the guests. So I was asked to go to the nearby supermarket to buy ice. When I was leaving the chalet, I have to walk out through the car park, and there was this man standing there, just looking at my villa. I didn't have any thoughts, so I just walked towards him since I have to walk past him to leave the compound. When I walked past him, he asked whether my family is staying there and just nodded. He said to me, Be careful, huh? This place quite active, if you know what I mean, especially your villa. I got creeped out, so I faked a smile and made my way. When I came back with ice packs, I noticed the man is now looking into the bushes behind our villa. He was just acting weird, but still I chose to ignore him. We had a total of 15 to 20 people in there around 7 p.m., and everybody was having fun, nothing scary or whatever. That's when the same man appeared again. I was at the barbecue with one of my cousins while the rest of our relatives were inside enjoying the air conditioner and chit-chatting. He approached us at the barbecue and said, Don't stay outside for too long. There's a grave here. Our reaction was like, What the fuck? We just thought that he was a psycho and choose to join the family inside just to be safe, you know? Still nothing happened and all the guests went home at around 12 a.m. My grandma, parents, and siblings have already washed up by 12.30 a.m. And I was the last one since I was still eating and catering food. I totally forgot about the psycho guy and was eating alone outside near the barbecue pit now. That's when the disturbances start. I heard someone calling me in the bushes that the man was pointing out. Psst. Psst. Initially I ignored it, but suddenly I heard a faint cry from that same direction. This was my last straw, and I ran up to the bedroom to sleep without even washing up. Thankfully, nothing else happened to me that night. But when we reached home... That was when everyone started sharing their experience. Firstly, my grandma said that she saw a woman staring at us in the forested area when we first reached, and that's the reason that she said what she said. She described the woman as a faceless being. My mom then said that when she was showering, she heard the same faint cry as me at the point of the same timing. Nothing happened to my siblings, but my dad shared that when he went to smoke near the forested area, he constantly felt somebody caressing his hair, and when he left, he heard somebody calling out his name. After that day, my family and I decided that we are no longer going to book that chalet anymore. The first and the last. Do you know where this place is? Singapore Ghost Story 2 From 2010 to 2014, I lived in this house in West Street 42. I'm not going to name the block, but it was located near the supermarket. Throughout those four years, I had always felt uneasy living there. The houses there were quite old. I lived on the sixth floor and getting home was complicated. 
Back then, the lifts in my house only stopped at levels 4 and 7. Hence, in order to get home, I had to walk a long corridor and go one level down to reach home. At night, I could say at least 80% of the time there were faulty lights along the corridor at level 7. Walking along the corridor never felt good. You know those types of chills that you get? I always felt cold and my hair would stand on each time I'd walk through that corridor. That's the reason why I run along the corridor most of the time, especially at night. I always feel like somebody's following me from the back all the time. Now here come the hauntings that my family and I faced. I faced two incidents back at that old house. One incident happened when I came back home from school and I was alone at home. I was preparing for my PSLE at that time and alone at home around 4 p.m. When I was revising, the earpiece I hung on one end of the wall hooks started untangling on its own at a very high speed before falling onto the floor. No questions asked, I ran straight to my grandparents' house. The second incident happened when I was eating in the kitchen with my helper. We were eating and she asked me whether I felt weird about the house. This was around 7 p.m. when she asked that question, the microwave immediately flew open on its own. I forgot what happened next, but we shifted two to three months after these incidents. After we moved, my dad said that he didn't feel anything in that old house. But my mom told us her stories. Throughout the years, she frequently sees a hand waving at her from the kitchen window. Like just an arm waving. We lived on the sixth floor, so there was no way anybody could have waved at my mom. She also complained about the feeling of being followed at level seven. When we told her grandma this, she told us that she knew something about that apartment, but she didn't want to tell us so that we don't, you know, become too scared of living there. She said that when she came out of the lift at level seven, she always would see this dark figure waiting at the corner, and that dark figure will always follow anyone back to their house. Sometimes this figure will follow all the way into the house, and sometimes it'll just follow back to the doorstep and leave us alone. I'm just thankful that I didn't see anything there except for the small disturbance, but for sure I wouldn't want to go back to that house. My friend actually runs a blog that shares ghost stories from Singapore. And since I'm not allowed to promote here, you could check out my profile and leave me a message if you're interested to know more. Singapore Canal, Hungry Ghost Month. This incident took place a few years ago when I was still in primary school. Back then, my family and I were still living in one of the, you know, apartments in the West. There was a large canal behind our HDB block, and there's a secondary school. I believed it's already merged with another secondary school near my block. Since it's the Hungry Ghost Festival now, I thought it would be perfect timing to share this story as it took place during the Hungry Ghost Month. Since I was young, my family made it a point to prepare offerings during the ghost month, and we always prepare the offerings facing the canal. After doing what we were told, my siblings and I loved playing at the canal area, where we play catch and sometimes spot fishes. Although we couldn't really see any, we did it anyway. Over the years, nothing much happened, until something happened eventually. As usual, we started playing after placing the offerings, and since I was already older, I knew about a lot more things. I read somewhere that you could see ghosts when you look in between your legs, which is a common Asian belief. I didn't know what I was thinking, but I thought that it would be the best situation to try out this myth. I took a deep breath and decided to do it. I spread my legs apart and look in between it. My view was the offerings that were placed earlier, but I didn't see anything. In my mind, I thought to myself, my parents are liars. Why are there no ghosts? 
Although I didn't see anything, little did I know I have influenced my younger brother. The next thing I saw was my younger brother mimicking my actions while giggling to himself. Since nothing happened to me, I thought it would be the same for him, but I was wrong. His giggling turned to a loud cry. He started shouting, Booyao! repeatedly, while crying, which translates to, I don't want. As soon as he started crying, all the candlelights faded, even though there was no wind. As usual, I was laughing because my young, dumb mind thought that he was joking. Not long later, my parents came and I got an ass-whooping for influencing my younger brother. After much consoling done by my parents, my little brother opened up to us. He said that it was crowded and there were many people squatting. What I remember was him describing a large group of people squatting around the offerings and began moving towards him when he looked in between his legs. After hearing that, I couldn't sleep the whole night because I was scared that those things followed us home and was watching me sleep. Although nothing paranormal happened that night, my parents brought us to the temple to cleanse ourselves and get rid of any negative energy. I moved a few years later and saw some articles claiming that the area is supposedly haunted. Maybe that's the reason why I had the chills at the time when I was there, but thankfully, nothing happened to me. Singapore Night Safari Ghost Story This incident happened to myself back in 2010 or 2009, if I remember correctly. Back then, the Night Safari had a Halloween special, and in my opinion, it is way scarier than the Halloween Horror Nights in the U.S., we had many decorations from hanging haunted dolls, Chinese zombies, realistic tombstones, and many more. The main theme was spooky tales of Asia, or something along those lines. I was working there back then, and there were many ghost encounters that were reported to us, the staff. The reason I say reported is because many of the guests do not know that they actually encountered something. Here's some of the stories. Firstly, my personal encounter with the supposedly realistic Pontianac. Back then, I was one of the staff roaming around the compound near the boardwalk. I found what it was, and it was called, but it was something along those lines. When I was there, I frequently received this compliment that the decorations on the trees look realistic. Initially, I just smiled and nodded to them, for compliments, but suddenly I thought to myself, what is this decoration that so many people are attracted to? After about four to five compliments, I was approached by this couple. I'm not sure whether they're Japanese or Korean. They said to me in English, though, the flying lady, very good. That's when I realized that it was not any of the decorations. There was no flying lady involved at all, and in my mind, I immediately thought of the Pontianac. I wasn't really scared since there were a lot of people there, but I definitely had the chills being in that area. The second story happened to one of my friends who was working at the train attraction. If I'm not wrong, it's called Train of Horror during the Halloween event. What she experienced was similar to me, but it's way scarier. She was one of the scare actors there, and as usual, they will naturally start jump-scaring the guests. The creep started coming when one of the tourists on the train said to his friend, These two are by far the scariest ghosts we've seen this ride. She thought to herself, These two? She was alone in there the whole time, and at first she believed that the tourists were playing a trick on her. Slowly, she realized that some of the tourists were recording something else each time they passed her zone. Instead of pointing the camera to her, they were pointing it to the area behind her. The last story is a famous one, but I just thought of sharing it since it's one of the more creepy ones. No one told me this story specifically, but I managed to eavesdrop the conversation between the other staffs. They were making jokes about how some of the scare actors were really into their role, and one of them even decided to sit on top of the tram. 
However, none of them did. The drivers insisted that they clearly saw someone sitting, but no one admitted to it. Or maybe there was actually no one there. Old Boon Lay Disturbance Recently I came to know that Boon Lay is a famous place for ghost stories. Being a huge fan of the paranormal, I read a lot of stories and listened to a lot of horror podcasts. That's when I came upon the story that claimed Boon Lay to be a paradise for ghosts. And the reason for this is that many of those who practiced black magic left their things there when they shifted, meaning they moved. I guess this explains my encounters back when I was staying there. My family and I used to stay in Boonlay way back, and now Boonlay looks better with the new blocks and other infrastructure. Back then the whole atmosphere actually felt gloomy, no offense, some of the people there seemed a bit peculiar as well, especially those living in the old apartments opposite the church. When I was young, around the age of seven or eight, my parents were strict on curfew timing. I must be back before 7 p.m. no matter what, and if there's any instance that I have to go back past 7 p.m., one of my parents will fetch me. This was due to a few stories that were famous back then in my neighborhood. These stories included paranormal sightings, and a majority of it was just talking about bomos and witches that were living in my area. At my age, I didn't know what all that meant, but I still followed the given curfew. Even though I was obedient, I remembered having a few disturbances. In one instance, I was home alone that night for about one hour since my parents went to buy groceries. I don't know what went on in my parents' mind since they already knew about those stories. The windows in my room were facing the corridor on the fourth floor, and since I was a scaredy cat, I kept it closed 90% of the time. While I was watching TV, I heard shuffling noise outside the corridor. The shuffling sounded like someone sweeping the floor using a sapulidi. Search on Google if you don't know. It's spelled S-A-P-U-L-I-D-I. I didn't think much of it until somebody whispered Malay from my window. I know you're alone in there. I immediately ran to my living room and my parents came home around two to three minutes later. I told them what happened and they said that there was no one outside. Keep this in mind, the sweeping sound carried on and only stopped when I heard my parents unlocking the gate. There were other disturbances such as the typical marble sounds, hearing my furniture move on their own in the middle of the night, but as a kid, I just slept through it. However, my mother had the scariest encounter. She went out in the middle of the night to use the toilet, and when she went out to the living room, she saw me entering the toilet and the toilet lights were already on. She sat in our dining room table for about five minutes and I was still inside the toilet. She started calling out for me from outside, but there was no response. She realized that the door wasn't closed properly and decided to take a peek. There was no one. After that incident, we made it a point not to leave our rooms after 10 p.m. But I find it weird that we didn't bother cleansing the house. After we moved, we no longer have any disturbances. However, one question remains in my mind. Has the whole boon lay haunted? Or was it just my house? Or is it just the block? I guess... Excuse me. I guess the question will remain unanswered. The Badok Auntie, Singapore Horror Story. This incident took place a few years back in the Badok area. I don't want to disclose the area because this incident is probably one-time thing and I don't want to attract unnecessary attention, you could say. I still live in the same house now, but after all these years, the area still feels off sometimes. When I'm going home in the wee hours, there'll still be people loitering around my area 
but I've always had this feeling of somebody following me back. But one particular incident proved my assumptions. I was going home around 10 p.m. after my football training in secondary school. I didn't feel anything off at all, but there was fewer people hanging out and just hanging around in general as usual. Surprisingly, I enjoyed the peace, and I didn't feel scared at all. When I reached my deck, around 50 meters away from the lift, this Malay auntie stopped me. She looked normal, hunched-backed, a tudung covering her head and had no teeth or dentures. She asked me, Do you live here? In Malay. I nodded my head and she smiled. Do you need my company? She continued. I shook my head and apologized to her. I made an excuse of needing to rush home and just left her there. When I left her, I could hear her feet shuffling. I tilted my head a little and saw her walking with tiny steps tailing me from behind. I continued to take glances and I realized that her shuffling pace increased. I didn't think twice and ran to the lift and luck was on my side. The lift was on the first floor. I got in, pressed the fourth floor, and I was on my way. When I reached my level, I still heard the shuffling sound, and out of curiosity I looked down the staircase. I saw the same Malay auntie making her way up and she was already on the second floor. How did she walk that fast? At that point in time I knew something was off and I quickly went inside my house. Thankfully my parents were still awake and I told them what happened. They asked me to recite some prayers and forced me to take a shower immediately. When I thought that everything was over, the disturbance continued. When I was about to fall asleep, I heard the same shuffling noise in the corridor outside my room window. I covered my ears and my face, but the fear stayed inside. In the end, I slept in my parents' room. Thankfully, after that day, I no longer see that auntie, and I heard that shuffling noise ever again. Since I still stay here now, I made it a habit to blast my music and brisk walk home from the bus stop every single time without fail. Anyone from Badak have any similar experience? Clementi Woods Park, Pekong. Everyone in Asia will be familiar with the term Pekong, or what many of us refer to as Gula Gula. What if I told you it doesn't sound like what you expect it to be? We usually associate Pekong to a ghost wrapped in white cloth and jumping from one place to another, but it's wrong. It's usually covered in filthy cloth with zero hint of whiteness, and it's floating instead of jumping. Back in 2012, if I remember correctly, I had two separate incidents and encounterings with this Pekong. The first incident took place during my friend's gathering. There was around five of us and we were chilling in this hut, you could call it, gossiping and laughing. The typical teenager stuff. It was getting late and there wasn't as many people, but we stayed up until the late hours. Nothing supernatural happened until we took a selfie. The first picture we took looks normal, but the second picture, the pekong, was in the frame. At first glance, you might not suspect it as a pekong, as it just looks like a brown spot. But upon closer inspection, we realized that there were slight facial features. The scariest part was that the pekong was about 8 to 10 meters behind us, floating beside a street lamp. None of us said anything because we didn't want to, quote-unquote, alert the Pekong. I mean, most of our parents usually remind us not to acknowledge its presence because it's similar to inviting it over. But one of my dumbass friends says, Hey, look, got something, say, like a Pekong, haha. <laughs> when he said that, there was a quick gush of wind and a foul smell. A better way to describe the smell is rotten eggs. Already uneasy, all of us stood up and made our way to the nearby HDB block to Lepak, and there, instead, we sat. Nobody opened up about that experience, and we all deleted our pictures, even the ones without the Pekong. Luckily, none of us had any disturbances that night. The second incident took place a few months later. 
I could still remember the Pekong incident vividly, but I still made the decision to go for a late night run. I was actually going through a tough time and really needed some fresh air. I had no intentions to run into the Clementi Woods Park, but somehow I ran and appeared there. There were a few other joggers, so I wasn't that scared, but there are times where I appear to be alone. Everything was fine until I ran past this playground in the park. The Pekong was playing peekaboo with me. As I ran past, the same-looking Pekong peeked out from the back of a pole at the playground. I sped up and felt like my stamina was back at full tank. As I was making my way out, the Pekong appeared two more times, once behind a tree and one more time behind some bushes. I knew my eyes weren't playing tricks on me, but luckily I managed to reach home safe. Again, there were no disturbances at home, but I really couldn't sleep that night. And this is the first time I'm sharing this story, really. Thankfully, the Bakong doesn't follow people home, and I wonder if there's other people who have similar stories regarding the Bakong. Now, I still live in the West, but I made it to a point to never visit that place again. Sometimes, when I really have to drive past that area, I still will get the chills, and I always feel somebody peeking at me. Singapore Annabelle Back in June of 2014, there were images of this doll known as the Hyogang doll, and it was circulating around the internet. Mostly on Reddit and Twitter. You could search the image of the doll on Google, but I couldn't place it in the blog due to the copyright. It was found in a bed in pretty bad condition and lying on a tree with Bismillah, which translates to in the name of Allah, in Arabic, written on the cloth and covering its eyes. The cloth with that writing was believed to trap whatever jinn or evil entity inside the doll. Many was warned against removing the blindfold, but a few days later the doll was missing and believed to be taken by someone else. There were many speculations on the doll. The doll was said to be moving around in the house on its own when the owner wasn't around, and sometimes... A female voice could be heard from the doll when it's left alone in a room. Some also say it's a Malay female voice. Not a gecko. When they enter the room, the head of the doll will be facing a different direction as well. They believe that the only way of getting rid of the doll was to place it far away from home with the cloth covering its eyes. On the same day, there was a reported murder case as well as a suicide case. While some say it's a coincidence, others believed otherwise. While there was no definitive evidence to this case, it's still quite creepy if you ask me. The features of this doll are the most contributing factor. Sometimes I wonder whether the whole thing was just a setup or a prank, and at the same time, who in their right mind would leave a haunted doll on the side of a road below a tree? Army Outfield Disturbance This happened around 1 to 2 a.m. when I had to do my prowling with my buddy at that time. We were supposed to do our rounds in a circle, but we got lazy, so we decided to create our own route, which only involved us walking to the latrine and then walking back to the starting point. It was a straight route. Everyone was asleep, including our sergeants, and to be very honest... I was so tired that fear didn't even enter my mind. Everything was going well until our third round when I had to use the latrine. I was damn buck up one. I could literally shit anywhere unlike my other platoon mates who held their shit until we came back to our company. So I was doing my business peacefully and my buddy was rushing me. Faster, Le. He repeated this every one minute for real. After a while, he stopped and I was so relieved because the shit as well as the silence. When I was cleaning up after myself, my friend spoke again. Finish already? I walked out of the latrine and guess what? My friend was just staring at me blankly as if he saw a ghost. I told him to stop fooling around since it really wasn't the right time. He whispered to me, Let's 
should stop patrolling. Let's just go to bed. Even though I was buck up, I would never go against the rules because I wanted to keep my records clean, you know? I told him no, but he was legit getting pale. Then he said to me, I swear I saw a head continuously peeking out of the latrine area when you were inside, and I know it wasn't you because it wasn't wearing our uniform. I finally realized the reason he asked me to go faster. After hearing that, I quickly turned to face the latrine, and what I saw creeped me out. So in order for us to navigate the latrine, glow sticks were placed around the area. What I saw was the glow stick sliding along the string back and forth at a constant speed. No such animal could do that, and if there was an animal, we could clearly see it. But it was clear that there was nothing there since we were only five to ten meters away. There was no wind either. We went straight to the HQ area and woke up one of the commanders. After telling them what we encountered, he just told us to go to sleep and not to tell anyone anything. That night I didn't get to sleep at all and being in a confined sort of shell scrape made it worse. Thankfully it was the last night there. I'm too lazy to type out the full encounters of my friends, but I'll just share some of their encounters. One of my friends said that he heard the Muslim call for prayer at 12 a.m., doesn't make sense since it's not the time for Muslims to pray, and we were pretty sure that there is no mosques in that area. Another one of my friends claimed that he heard children giggling during their taking cover exercise, which happened around 7 or 8 p.m. The last disturbance was the sound of bells following my friend. He was doing his patrolling a few hours after me, but he was doing his patrol alone at one point, as his buddy also had to use the latrine. He said that he didn't see anything, but when he was walking around, he heard this constant bell sound following from behind, and judging from the loudness of the sound, he said it was almost directly behind him. Grandma is still alive. Some backstory. There's a family of five staying together. Parents, two siblings, and my grandma. So my grandma has been staying with my aunt and cousins for a while before she passed on. On the day she passed, the whole family came down and everybody was greatly affected. My grandma was one of the nicest people in the world, and she took care of all of us equally. I frequently visited my aunt's house just to meet my grandma, and she would constantly give me pocket money and cook for me even though she was not well herself. However, it affected my cousin the most, since they had been staying with the grandma since birth, and at that point in time, they were around 12 years old and 9. After that day, my aunt realized that her younger daughter started spending less time with the family and locked herself in her room more often. Let's call my older cousin P and my younger cousin Q to make it easier. My aunt started to become suspicious of Q and thought that she had a boyfriend. So she decided to ask P to be her spy. The next day, P told my aunt that Q claimed to be talking to Grandma. She asked P to keep it as a secret. After my aunt told her husband about this, Q received a very bad scolding and they reinforced that Grandma was no longer around. From that day onward, she was forced to leave the door open, and P was forced to sleep in the room with her. A few days went on and nothing happened. However, about a week later, weird things started happening again. P claimed that Q started creeping out of the room slowly and started talking to Grandma in the kitchen again. She informed her mom again, but this time, instead of confronting her, my aunt and her husband decided to eavesdrop on the conversation. Initially, they thought that Q was developing mental issues like depression, but when they eavesdropped the conversation, they knew something wasn't right. Q was giggling the whole time while talking to Grandma. The conversation also sounded real. They talked about what she ate, what she did in school, and her problems. They eavesdropped for a few nights, and one day, they decided to take action. When they stepped into the kitchen, what they really saw proved to them that Q needed professional help. 
in Q's hands was raw chicken meat, and she was reaching across the dining room table as if she's feeding someone. My aunt screamed and Q was startled. I wasn't there to witness this, but I could imagine how bad it was. Pete told me that Q started crying and asked, Where did Nenek go? I forgot what happened next, but the next morning my uncle brought Eustace over to help out. Eustace is like a Muslim version of a priest, for those who don't know. The Eustace came and Q immediately acted weird. She wasn't possessed or anything, but she kept on asking why the Eustace came and said that she didn't like it. When the Eustace started reading some Quranic verses, Q started shouting in Malay, Stop, Nenek is in pain! No one else saw Nenek except for Q. Also, we Muslims do not believe in spirits of the dead, meaning once you passed on, you'll go to afterlife and you won't come back as spirits. The Eustace asked my aunt whether she kept any items that grandma left behind. That's when my aunt realized Q kept the dress or maybe pajamas that grandma wore on the day she passed, and to be honest, it was filthy. They took the dress and passed it to the Eustace when the uncle went to help Q in his arms since she was getting restless and wanted to stop my aunt. The Eustace placed the dress in a bucket of water that had chronic verses read into it, something like holy water. The Eustace explained that the filthy clothes attracted certain jinns, also known as demons, and it took the form of grandma. The jinn took advantage of Q's emotional state to use her, after the whole ritual, the dress was disposed of, and Q was quite affected by the whole thing. Eventually, she became better, and now she's back to normal. Personally, I don't find this story scary, but I thought that it was a good story to share. I find this story more sad. Sad because the love of all of us had for our grandma, and especially Q. I know a lot of us still miss grandma, but we all know that she's in a better place. Palau Ubin Kids Have you heard of OBS, Outward Bound Singapore Camp? Almost every secondary school student would have gone to this camp, and this incident happened to me so many years back. Back then I was 15 and my group was one of the groups that had to go to the Palau Ubin for the most part. There was another group, but they stayed on the mainland. Boring, in my opinion. I wouldn't say that the campsites there are run down, but the atmosphere there was definitely different. While it's surrounded by beautiful nature, it was somewhat spooky, especially at night. The main campsite was the best because it was the most modernized. However, there was another campsite that was quite bad. I forgot the name of the campsite, but I remembered my group kayak to that campsite. So, in the other campsite, we slept in the middle of this forested area in our tents, and our kayaks were placed at one corner. There were no toilets, and we had to do our business in the dark with only one or two glow sticks lighting up the area. Thankfully, we had to sleep there for only one night. That night, I didn't even bother cleaning myself up. I went straight to bed. I was too shagged out because my group had a lot of girls and some useless guys. Being the only bigger sized dude, I was tasked to carry all the heavy jerry cans around. Little did I know, going to bed straight wasn't the best decision. In the middle of the night, I had to take a piss and I was the type that you can't really hold. So when I woke up, the other guys were in deep sleep and I wasn't the scared type, so I decided to walk out alone. Let me tell you this, the outside was so dark and the moon barely did anything to light up the area. I used my torch to make my way to the makeshift toilet, quote unquote, and everything went smoothly. When I was peeing, that's when I heard children laughing. I almost shit my pants because who in their right mind would be playing in the middle of the night? Also, it couldn't be any of them at the campsite because it was giggling of a toddler, not somebody who's 15. There was no way it was a prank as well, as all of our phones were confiscated. After the giggling, it was followed by the sounds of bushes rustling. 
I don't know why, but my instant reaction was to shine my torch in that direction. Guess what I saw? I saw three kids running away from me into the forested area. Why do I say running, you may wonder. They had legs, but none of their legs were touching the ground. They were quote-unquote running with their legs about four to five inches above the ground. I ran back to my tent, covered my face with my sleeping bag. Eventually, I went back to sleep despite being scared. I kept this to myself and only shared it with my friends after the whole OBS camp ended. When I went back home, I searched online and found out that there were other similar incidents where they all saw kids roaming around. That's all that happens to me and my friends, which I'll submit when I'm free, too. Hope this story is scary enough to be featured. Well, it was here. And that's the end of today's stories, and I, well, rather please forgive me for any pronunciations of anything in Malay. I'll work on it. Have a good night. See ya. Good evening. Welcome back to Paranormal M. Help us work the algorithm by dropping a comment below, respond to stories, or leave your own six cents on the matter. It helps us a lot to grow our channel and keep us going. So, enjoy the ride. The Girl Standing at the Front Door When I was 11 years old, my dad took me and my brother to a party. He apparently knew the people, but me and my brother didn't. They had just moved into this house, and that was what the party was for. After about an hour, a man came up to me and a group of kids, asking us to go to his house to grab some more firewood because we were running out. Us all being trusting kids all said okay, and we ran to have fun. I remember feeling uneasy, but I pushed the feeling aside and kept moving onward until I reached the house. Each person grabbed two pieces of wood, but I only grabbed one because I felt that I was too small to carry two pieces. Everyone got mad at me and said it was only fair, so I went back for another piece. I made them pinky promise not to leave me, but when I came back out, they were all gone. Realizing I was alone, I started to panic because I didn't know my way back. I'd never been here before. I started to scope out the area thinking somebody had to stay behind with me, but no one was there. I was about to give up and aimlessly walk around looking for my way home when suddenly I saw a girl standing by the front door. She had big curly red hair, big blue eyes, red little freckles, and a white nightgown. She wore nothing on her feet. She looked like one of the girls in the group, so I called out to her but she just stood silently, staring off blankly. The more I stared at her, the more her body seemed to fall apart. Her hair seemed missing in certain areas. She was skin and bones thin. She had twigs and leaves in her hair, and her skin was pale and soaked. I feared she was getting too cold, so I shouted over to her, shouted again. She ignored me. Finally, I took a step toward her and she smiled. Her eyes went jet black and empty. She turned around and ran inside laughing. I followed her and searched the whole house for half an hour. When I came back out, everybody had come back for me, asking where I was. I was panicked and I told them about the injured girl that needed help. They just looked at me confused. They assured me that there was no girl before laughing at me like I was bonkers. I kept telling them about it and they were just as confused as I was. We went back to the party and acted like nothing happened. But I had this bad feeling. So I went to the mom in the party and told her the whole story. And She asked about the man that sent us for more wood because they never needed more in the first place. I gave her her description well, she said that that man had never been to the party. She didn't know who I was talking about. She gathered all of us who told the same story about the same man. 
She said that she didn't know who he was, but she was drunk and didn't seem too worried. So she just told us to be safe. The hat man I described before in these forums was not actually the quote-unquote hat man. Turns out the apparition that I saw that night is not the hat man at all, but a trapped spirit. Let me explain. This is actually good news, at least for most of the people who have seen this being in night terrors and paralysis. I have no idea what it means for me in this point onwards. In my older account, I came back after a three-year hiatus on Reddit and replied to a post to someone, describing a solid black apparition that I saw several years ago. I described it as having an oversized fedora hat with a large overcoat. All of it solid black. Indeed, a blacker-than-night description by someone else in the forum, and how it looks much like the profile of the burglar on one of those neighborhood night watch number trespassing signs, located sporadically throughout close-knit middle upper class neighborhoods in the early 80s. That's how it was described by somebody else. And I thought at the time, I couldn't have described it better. I then got all these replies about the hat man. One after another, after commenting on a person's post about apparitions that we saw, I had no idea about this phenomenon and I was extremely puzzled on why I didn't see this in sleep paralysis. But at 8pm at night, while the group of people in a semi-public building, I didn't know what all that really meant and then I theorized that perhaps, this is perhaps a multi-dimensional being and not a spirit. And if the world of dreams is a dimension all in itself, then this being can perhaps travel in between dimensions at will, regardless. It's good conjecture. When I was taking a break from this forum, which I do a lot because of negativity, I was just browsing through YouTube channels and after I was done watching one documentary, I was surprised to see the name of the building of where I saw this hat man on the head title of a documentary that was going to autoplay next. I watched the show with only mild interest, since I was taking a break from the sub, and within five to eight minutes into the documentary I saw it. A very old photograph of a man. Very old, I mean Napoleonic era times old. With that exact hat I described before, oversized large fedora stovetop hat, perched on his head with a very large overcoat being worn, I gasped. For real, I really, really did. I couldn't believe it, for even though I saw it as a solid black apparition, there was no doubt in my mind those were the clothes it was wearing when I saw it that night. My blood ran cold and I got sick for over an hour. The quote-unquote blood ran cold. It's an expression, but the sickness is not. There was way more to this person than I ever thought possible. He was an alleged serial killer executed on the grounds of this building I was at. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why I got sick. The intuitive glands working on overdrive. Or maybe it's just my preconceived prejudices of the situation. I'm not claiming any special psychic ability, merely intuition. Speaking of preconceived notions, what if it showed itself to me because he was actually innocent? doomed to walk the grounds of this old building for multiple centuries since the day of his execution. Also, if he is guilty of the crimes he's accused of, I would think being trapped for over 200 years as a spirit doesn't seem to match the karma of a vicious killer, at least from a philosophical standpoint. In the East, there is no distinction between religion and philosophy my father's teacher being a Tibetan Buddhist monk. The punishment does not fit the crime from the metaphysical sense, and perhaps being wrongly accused has made him a tortured soul. Perhaps he was wrongly accused and was thus executed, all of his money and property being forfeit. 
that would make me a real pissed off spirit if I ever say so myself. I won't say the name of this place, nor the name of this alleged serial killer. The sleuths out there who are motivated by delving into dark history may find out the place I'm speaking of. I did slip up once and I mentioned it a long while back. I'm going to try to find out if he's innocent or a killer. First by historical research, and then who knows after that. I was thinking about seeing if anyone here wanted to team up and go to this place or simply take turns on sessions. Skeptic or believer alike will be welcome for this project. This will be a great opportunity for each side to find some answers by working on a project together, with both sides having equal motivation in solving the case. As well, perhaps shutting down the discussion in question on whether EVPs are fake, misidentified, pradiolia, or random radio waves or all the above. Even if it's just for a couple of weeks, that would be remarkable. Unusual activity the day my dad had died. Growing up, him and I watched ghost adventures, paranormal caught on camera, horror movies. You name it, we probably watched it together. He died December 15th, 2021. He died from his third time with cancer. On December 15th, 2021, I woke up and sat up exactly at 9.30 a.m. Not missing a beat, my mom walked in and announced the news. He was pronounced dead at 9.30 a.m. Oddly enough, three light bulbs died out of nowhere in the main bathroom. That day, December 15th, was also particularly very windy and stormy. Three shingles were blown off the house. Weird, right? After the morgue people came and got my dad's body, and a priest came to console my mom and I, very nice of him, after everybody left, I went to go change the light bulbs in the bathroom. I go downstairs to the basement to look for the good bulbs. I felt a shoe hit the back of my leg. I turn around and the shoes that are kept by the landing were being picked up and chucked at me down the stairs. I initially thought that it had to be the cat knocking them down. But no cats around. They were literally levitating and coming at me. Honestly, I thought it was funny, like my dad had his strength and sense of humor again. Also, he owed me a paranormal experience after all the years of ghost documentaries that we used to watch. Entity walking around the house. Hey everybody. So I had to sleep on the couch downstairs because my bed is broken and I heard some weird sounds. So at 11 p.m. I decided it was a good time to stop working on homework and go to sleep. I spent about an hour talking to my friends, texting on the couch, and then attempted to go to sleep for real. It took me until around 1 a.m. to find a good position and also to ignore people messaging me. I decided on me facing on the couch and my back exposed because it's hot as fuck in Texas. So anyways, five minutes later, everything was really quiet and I heard the floor creak upstairs like when somebody moves on the bed. I just thought it was my mom and sisters moving around in their bed. They're all asleep in the same bed and the room is right above the living room, which is where I was sleeping. I hear it more and more until I hear someone actually stepping off the bed, and I guess, moving. Again, I just thought it was my mom. I also heard someone being in the kitchen and moving around the stuff that we had cleaned, but not put away and just overall walking in that area. There was some loud like pan clashing noises, and that's when I decided to turn around and cover myself fully with my blanket and try to go to sleep. At that point, it was like 2 a.m. I heard whatever was there go upstairs and kind of just walk around. So that's what I heard. When we were having breakfast, I asked my mom if she had gone downstairs or something. She usually does to go get the baby a smoothie so she can go back to sleep. 
but she said she didn't at all. I told her what I had heard during the night and that I didn't sleep well at all, and she looked at me shocked. So here's what my mom said when she heard or experienced this. My mom said that around 12 a.m. she went to her computer to work on some stuff, and that the whole time she was there, she heard me gaming in my room, like me laughing and my loud keyboard clicking for basically the whole duration of her working, that she even told me to shut up, but she said I didn't reply and just thought it was because I was wearing earbuds, which does happen when I'm gaming, to be honest. Anyways, at some point she heard me stop, and she looked in my little sister's room to see if I went to sleep there, didn't see me, and she was kind of sad that I had walked past her without saying goodnight and how quiet I supposedly was going downstairs. She didn't even notice. She was really good at hearing for that, and I had been downstairs since 11 p.m. And at that point, she said she noticed at like 2 a.m. When she was going to bed, she said that she heard walking all over upstairs, and that around 2.40 a.m. she started hearing like hard galloping outside in our backyard. So as a person would do, I tried to rationalize it, then and now, and in the moment I thought it was my mom, but obviously it wasn't fully her walking or doing stuff. Thought it was maybe the dog, but it sleeps outside and he's pretty quiet and actually sleeps as long as it's not really mating season. But there's nothing to explain the galloping. My mom checked the backyard cameras and they saw nothing at all. She was also upstairs the whole time and didn't see anyone. I also found it kind of weird that we couldn't hear each other despite how aware we were. Like my notification sound is a loud ass, just a loud ass sound. And it sounded at like 1.30 a.m. I had to turn it off or I would have not been able to sleep. Surely my mom would have heard it and it sounded twice. She said that she didn't hear anything like that. And from where we were located at those times, she would definitely have... I should have also heard her calling my name and telling me to be quiet to go to sleep, which she did loudly so I could hear her from the office to my room. We honestly don't know what's going on and we're both quite scared. We're planning on dousing the upstairs and downstairs with holy water. Right now I have to go to class so my mom's driving me, and her boyfriend, who's Muslim, gave us some prayers to play over the TV while we're gone to try to help. If y'all find some reasonable explanation, please repost it. Or what this might mean. Really shook my mom hearing the horse gallop as it went around three times, and each time it goes louder. I'm wondering if this is like an urban legend or something that might have meaning. You know, hearing loud galloping at 3 a.m. Outside Opinions or Thoughts First Post Not necessarily an encounter, but certainly scary. I'll also point out before starting the story that this may be a little all over the place, so to speak, or discombobulated, so I apologize. And number two, that I've never been scared of cemeteries at all, or the deceased for that matter. I've always found cemeteries to be peaceful, even at night. Crazy, I know. I had to spend much of my young life knowing I was going to be a mortician. And while I haven't gotten there yet due to money and school stuff, I hope to be soon. But let me jump right into this. So my girlfriend and I usually go to the cemetery when her roommates are in the dorm at her school and there's four of them. So we go quite often to the cemetery to, well... You can use your imagination to guess. But that's clearly not the point of this story. But to us, it's no big deal. I've never gotten a bad feeling there before, and neither has she. But this cemetery is off the beaten path. And like, I've been creeped out there, maybe. But nothing like bad, like, you know, not anything that sticks with me. However, tonight, it was different. I could feel it when it pulled up, but I was like, no big deal, I thought. 
Well, we do our thing and we usually just sit and talk for a few minutes after, because, like I said, this place is off the beaten path in a rural area. But tonight, we both, without even talking to each other, just got ready quick and got up to the front of my Buick, and as I was getting situated trying to get my coffee cup and the cup holder and stuff, I look over and my girlfriend's crying. She says calmly, we need to go now. And I said, okay. And I was still screwing with my cup trying to get it situated in the little cup holder and she yells, you're not fucking hearing me fucking drive now. This may be a time to point out that she doesn't swear at all, hardly. But like I said, I had the feeling the whole time we were there, but hearing her panic and knowing that she had, that she just was that panicked had me scared to death. I'll never go back there, she agreed. I don't know what this was, but it was tangible. You could feel the sensation of, if you don't leave now, you're going to die, accompanied with the very feeling of being watched. It's been an hour now, and I'm still shaken as she is. We both had a feeling of dread and doom for a while after leaving, and we stopped at a gas station to get some water and get our bearings together. I'm not sure what happened, but I don't want to go back there. I've only felt this way once before. If you made it this far, thank you so much. If you have any idea, kindly post them in the comments. You heard the man, folks. In the comment section, boost that algorithm for me. My first ever paranormal experience, which made me a believer, but I'm still skeptical. This happened just three months ago. I was trying to sleep at around noon and just pulling an all-nighter. The moment I fell asleep, I started suffering from sleep paralysis. I had people in my house and all sorts of noises were also coming through. I tried very hard to open my eyes, but I couldn't. I was fully aware. I could make out where I was, who was talking and saying what and everything, but I couldn't open my eyes for a while. Then I did open my eyes and I literally saw a black shadowy figure running back and forth in the room. It was black and smoky. I couldn't make out its body, but it seemed small and kind of shapeless. Then I said some prayers and tried to sleep and I started dreaming immediately. I saw that I'm in a war, wounded, and I'm fearing that I'm going to get captured by the enemies. And I know they'll torture me horribly, like dismember me and all. Then I woke up again and felt something touch my face. And that was the point where I believed that I'm not alone in the room. I was terrified, but I forced myself to wake up and stayed awake for the rest of the day. Then, a couple of days later, I was trying to sleep in my room. Previously, I was not in my room, and my room is secluded from the other rooms. So I'm all alone, and I was about to fall asleep, and I felt a sharp pain on the side of my chest, as if someone's pushing a finger against it. I felt the pain, and I woke up, turned to see who it is. I saw a human figure standing right next to my bed. I thought it's one of my cousins, and I also tried to ask who it is because I couldn't make out in the dark and then I woke up fully and realized it's gone and there's no pain at all. I was scared, but I dismissed it and slept and right then I felt somebody grab my neck with their cold hand and I stood right away, turned on all the lights in a panic and noped my way out of the room to where my siblings were hanging out. I was telling them all about what just happened. I told them I can't sleep in my room, so I'm just going to sleep on the sofa for the night in the living room. These were the two main and very realistic incidents, but I felt taps on my shoulder multiple times after this, and I still have skepticism about the incidents. Was it paranormal, or could it be something in my head? I don't know, but I'm just a guy, and I don't know for certain what that was. Still can't explain experience from several years ago. I was talking to my wife today, and an experience that we had came up, which we still can't explain. 
In February of 2013, we were dating at the time, we decided to take a weekend trip to a resort in Lake Delavan in Wisconsin. The weather was cold, but not unusually so, so we thought it would be a neat getaway. To set the stage, the place was pretty much deserted when we arrived. It's mostly a summer attraction for families from Illinois to come and vacation. There's a beach where you can go swimming and also a nearby golf course. People also frequently use the resort for weddings. However, when we were there, there was a thick layer of snow on the resort grounds, and the lake was frozen over from months of sub-freezing temperatures. Not even Valentine's Day was enough to attract more than a handful of guests. We checked in and we were directed to our room, which was about two-thirds of the way down a long, deserted hallway. The hallway had a line of rooms on the left side which faced the lake. Walking to the room was kind of eerie because we passed an arcade that was completely deserted and there was no sign of anyone else staying in that wing for the night. The hallway was completely empty and silent. When we arrived at the room, it seemed nice enough and had a pretty view of the frozen over lake. There was one bed adjacent to the wall nearest the bathroom which was on the right side when you entered the room. We decided to go out and walk on the ice, as my wife was from a warmer climate and had never done so before. When we returned, the first strange thing happened. As I opened the door to our room, I realized I'd left the light on. However, it abruptly turned off when we entered. It looked like one of those lights that has a timer and a motion sensor, so I dismissed it as a coincidence. The rest of the evening was pretty uneventful. We went to dinner at the resort restaurant and had a couple of glasses of wine. We were pretty tired, so we ended up going to bed pretty early. I awoke at 3 a.m. with an uneasy feeling. The room felt like somebody turned the heat off. As I shook off the fogginess of sleep, I noticed a figure standing next to the bed. My hair stood up as I tried to make out what it was. A woman with dark hair and a light-colored dress who was sort of glowing. Before I could make out any more details, she dissipated. I dismissed this as a dream and eventually drifted back to sleep. About an hour later, I woke again with the same feeling. She was back. However, this time I was able to make out more details. She appeared to be Native American and had braided hair with a light-colored traditional dress. I didn't get the sense that she wanted to harm me. She eventually dissipated again without saying anything or really moving. As I lay in bed, paralyzed by what I experienced, my wife abruptly sat up. Thinking she was awake, I said, Honey, are you up? I got no response. Her eyes were still closed, and she laid back down again. Later, she would tell me that she didn't have any memory of doing this. I didn't go to sleep for a long time after that night, but also didn't experience anything else. The next morning, we woke up and we were laying in bed talking. We hadn't been dating for that long at the time, and I was afraid of making her think I was crazy by telling her what happened. Finally, I decided to do it and see if she remembered anything from the night before. As I recounted my story... The lights on the headboard above us flickered on and off. They were turned off at the time, so I found this to be very strange. Later that morning, we went into the bathroom and also noticed that the sink was on full blast. Neither of us recalled even using the sink that morning. We checked out that day and asked the hotel receptionist in passing whether or not the resort had any reports of being haunted. I expected them to laugh it off, but instead, I got a very defensive vibe and denial from them. I later researched the lake and resort and found out that the grounds were home to Native American burial mounds and were known to be haunted. I had no idea that that was the case before we went. I even found a post discussing how staff reported seeing a woman in a white dress who had wandered the halls of the resort. Dream visitation from my dog that passed away. 
Last night I had a dream of my dog who passed away about two months ago. My dog died very, very suddenly. He got sick randomly and within three days he had to be put down due to having brain cancer and tumors. He was in otherwise perfect health, fairly young and just an overall happy dog. It was extremely traumatizing and took weeks and weeks for me to come to terms with it. Sometimes it still doesn't feel real. Let me start with, I am spiritual and I believe in the paranormal. I'd like to believe this was a visitation, but either way it was very comforting. In my dream I was in a forest. It was very bright and green about midday, and it was right at that sweet spot temperature where it's not too hot and not too cold. There was a calm pond of water near us. He was in my arms, so, so happy to see me. He had his happy ears on. His ears were pressed against his head, and his tail was wagging so hard his butt was wiggling. He wasn't whimpering or yelping anymore like he was before we had to put him down. He was yelping with excitement like he used to when he'd see me, and he was kissing my face nonstop with his super stinky breath. I remember feeling his hind legs and being so happy when we could move them without pain. He lost the use of his back legs in the last few hours. Everything was super real feeling, and I rarely have dreams that feel so realistic. It felt like I was actually holding him, and no other dog has quite felt like him. The strangest part of this dream was that I was aware this wasn't happening in my day-to-day -day reality. I knew that this was just in passing, like my pongo was dead and when I woke back up he would still be gone. I didn't feel sad though, I was so unbelievably happy. I heard a thought in my head that wasn't actually my thought, but it wasn't anything I heard out loud either, it was something along the lines of, I'm happy and at peace. I am no longer in pain. I struggled with guilt ever since I put him down. I felt like I couldn't, I just could have done more to prevent it. Or if that I've given him more time, he would have been able to pull through. The reality was, is that it was his time. He wasn't a good candidate for any form of treatment, and he wouldn't have gotten better with no treatment. It was so nice to see him again and hold him again, though. Urgent. Scratching at door and nothing's there. The time's currently 1 a.m. and approximately an hour ago I got out of the shower to see my boyfriend grabbing his gun from his bedroom. When I asked him what was going on he told me he heard a clear scratching noise on our front door. He and I both being decently superstitious ran to ensure all doors and windows were locked before checking the peephole. And after a few minutes, we opened the door and found nothing there. Our next door neighbor leaves for work at 10 p.m. and stays within his apartment this late otherwise, and our downstairs neighbor just moved, so there's no chance of a neighbor noise being mistaken as something else. Both pets were also accounted for, had been nowhere near the door, so there's also no chance there. After some time, we went to get snacks and turn on a movie, and shortly after it started, we heard a very light tapping near the top of the door, and what could have been some sort of contact with the door handle. Still nothing in the peephole, and so we paused the movie to listen. Right before I was going to play the movie again, there was a very clear scratching near the bottom of the door. For the both of us to witness this time, it's been about 15 minutes since the noise and we restarted the movie, reassuring ourselves that if there was anything to be concerned about, our reactive watchdog would warn us. The cat's been staring at the door and just uncharacteristically ran to jump at whatever appears to be nothing in the living room window. Is there any explanation for this? Paranormal or not, I'd like one, and hopefully for some knowledge of how to fix this issue or at least how to provide some kind of comfort so we aren't paranoid all night. Strangest sound I've ever heard in my life. 
This happened to me quite a few years ago. I was probably around 11 years old. I'm 19 now. I used to enjoy making blanket forts and sleeping in them. This particular night, I decided I was going to make one in my mom's room. I would sleep in my mom's room pretty often at that age. All was good. I was just hanging out in my fort, browsing Yahoo Answers because I was a weird kid. I don't remember ever what exactly I was doing when this happened, but all of a sudden I heard the most horrifying sound. I've never heard something like this again and I can't describe it for the life of me. It was unlike anything I've ever heard before. I was wide awake and I don't believe I was dreaming or anything. I remember it like it was yesterday because it scared me that bad. It was loud. My mom's the lightest sleeper ever, but she didn't even move a muscle. She swore that she was going to wake up, but she didn't react. Or I swore she was going to wake up, but she didn't react. It was so loud like whatever made the noise was right beside me. It didn't sound natural. I can't explain it well, like I said I have genuinely tried to find anything that replicated what I heard in any way. But I truly have never heard anything like it. I guess it sounded like a shriek from an animal, maybe. It went on for maybe five or eight seconds, and then radio silence. I also wasn't the kind of kid to spook at weird noises. I always brushed everything off, like the house settling or whatever. But this paralyzed me with fear so bad I don't think I moved an inch for five minutes. Then I tore down the blankets, hopped in my mom's bed and hid underneath the covers the whole night. I live in a quiet neighborhood with little to no neighbors. I also don't have a huge forest around me where wildlife may be. I have no explanation, and to anybody reading this or hearing it, it probably doesn't sound that scary compared to other experiences, and people will tell me it was an animal. It was a TV in another room, but trust me, I've looked into every possible explanation, and I truly have no idea. I've never heard something so horrifying that sent me into shock so fast. Maybe it was nothing, but it still shakes me to my core, and I'll always remember it because I remember the pure fear I felt in that moment. My Childhood Teenager Experiences When my neighbor had died, I was about 8 to 10 years old and I was sitting alone at home for almost all day because my parents were working till evening. Meanwhile, I had early sleep time and my spare time was while they had been in absence. I was hearing steps going downstairs a few times with a shoe on, so it's loud and a characteristic sound. I was feeling watched. As evening approached, I was choosing for myself a room to sit in, usually the living room with television or the guest room with the computer. I was putting on the screen or something loud so I wouldn't be hearing any other sounds, and I was staring at these devices basically like a horse because sometimes I was seeing shadowy figures in the corner of my eyes. I was concentrating on staring only in front of my vision without moving my head or my body to not let anything be seen or heard. Sometimes windows and doors were closing and opening, but it could be a draft, and after these experiences I was too scared to check anyway. One day my grandpa had visited me, and when he heard these openings, they asked me if there's anything upstairs, a thief potentially, and I just answered, I don't know, thinking I'm just going to go check with Grandma. She went alone, closed all the windows, and it was good. I live in my family home for 20 years, and these drafts were happening after my neighbor died, and never before or after, so I still find them unusual. I don't live in an area where storms or tornadoes can happen also. <laughs> One day in the evening, in a day where my family were grilling and socializing, I had been playing on a swing, and I saw a very light, a concentrate of a shape of a circle, a figure flying fastly above me. I stopped playing and I asked if they seen something, and they told me nope. 
I probably just misunderstood what I saw, so I just went back. After some time, that bulb of light flew again, and it was much closer to me, so bigger too, and I got too scared to play. When I was older, a teenager, I learned to sleep in only one position, always the same side and facing the narrow of the bed, so if I opened my eyes, I was seeing only wall. That's because I was having lucid dreams, sleep paralysis, and nightmares almost every night. I don't want to be describing sleep paralysis because they are very similar for everyone. However, during them, I was seeing dark shadows chasing me. Sometimes I was feeling molested by them. They were touching me or lying on me, and they were calling my name. These times were the first when someone or something touched me like that ever. That sounds terrifying, but after I woke up, I just went back to sleep because that was only affecting me while it was happening. What scared me were things I experienced when I wasn't in sleep paralysis. Once I saw a very bright light, which looked like a phone with a flash measured at me. I was hearing voices when I could move, so I wasn't asleep. My name come here from a room I was most afraid of because of its energy. And one time I had to make a phone call to my friend, which was like an emergency because I heard something stretching my door. Stretching my door and a repeated melody signed by a chorus and a few voices, and I was, shh, shh, everyone's sleeping, shh, shh, everyone's sleeping. Well, I wasn't, and I was terrified because I was fully aware. I want to mention one dream, I think, where I was watching my own body from the room's corner, and I could move by think. I was seeing a 360 degree. That was interesting because I can't even imagine looking in that wide vision, but I remember what I was seeing them. My body, some furnitures, walls, and ceiling, everything at once. At one sunny day, we went as a family to a bike trip and I saw a male looking druggy in a dirty clothes, staring at me with fully dilated pupils. His eyes were black and seemed empty. I asked my family if they saw him. They told me no, crying face emoji. I asked for every other person that we used to omit and they confirmed they presence. Sorry, I'm reading this as is. Because of that, I was suicidal. During that time, I was having a dream where creatures looking like humans were transporting me out of my house and they were talking with me. They were tall, physically attractive, their energy was calming, understanding, full of love, I think, and very self-awarenesses, but also kind of robotic. At my last dream with them, they asked me if I want to join them or if I prefer to come back to Earth. I answered I prefer Earth because I have a human body. I'm used to entertainment, to culture, to society, that I don't think I would be able to with that body and blocked mind to perceive Earth's reality, to adapt to their conditions. He smiled at me and I woke up, feeling like I want to shit myself because that was so unreal. Psychiatrics used to assing my depression peels that weren't working. Psychiatrics used to assing my depression peels that weren't working. That's what it says. But I felt light after hypnosis sessions with a certified hypnoser. <clears throat> I don't experience any nightmares, any paralysis and strange things in general anymore. I sleep well and I'm happy. That's what happened in my childhood. These experiences don't affect me anymore, but they were real when they were happening. My point is not to seek for validations or to deny that. I just wanted to share my perception that times. <clears throat> Will my friend be able to see the texts I sent him after his passing? 
My friend recently passed. We went to school together, graduated together, and attended college together. He passed at just 23 years old. He was taken suddenly and way too soon. I didn't get a chance to say goodbye, and it sounds like he was in a lot of emotional pain at the end. He often didn't feel loved. I sent him a series of text messages yesterday after his memorial, burial, and wake. I just feel like he needs to hear how much he helped his friends over the years and how much we appreciate him. And that I'm so sorry that I wasn't there for him, but that I hope he could feel us there with him yesterday. I'm not sure if I believe in an afterlife in the Christian sense. I think that we either cease to exist or live in an eternal peace once we pass. We went to a Christian high school, though, and I feel like if anybody deserved an eternity of bliss and peace, it would be him. Is it possible for the deceased to feel or know that we sent them these wishes? Or to sense sadness, love, and regret? I just don't want him to feel like he wasn't loved. He was an amazing person and deserved the world. My sister woke me up at 3.26 a.m. to tell me she felt like she was being yanked away. Not safe for work warning. You've been warned. Don't blame me. My sister, M, 28, I'm going to just call her Mary. That's the narrator just putting a name in here. I don't like reading letters. And I, N, I'm going to go with Nate. Came to visit our family here in Mexico. When we were younger, weird things happened. But as we got older, we brushed them off as coincidences and wild imagination. Just to be safe, Mary and I shared the same room and the same bed. Even though there's two full beds in the room, we haven't had any bad experiences until tonight. Around 11ish tonight, a fight broke out between the two of us. She yelled, I yelled, and we ended up physically fighting. We told each other off and somehow managed to stay in the same bed. I mention this because it's absolutely not typical behavior for us, because it's the only thing that's different from the other nights here. At 3.26 a.m., Mary tapped me on my shoulder and was shaking. Her eyes were wide open looking past me. Instantly, I hugged her, and she latched onto me, crying into my chest. She asked me to look and see if there was something behind her. Her body was literally attached to mine, so I had to lift my body to peek. Nothing. Through her sobs, she managed to tell me that something tried to take her. She said that she was sleeping, woke up, and felt her body extremely heavy. She could see me sleeping face up but I seemed far away. As she was trying to process what was going on, she felt a massive yank that she described as her soul being pulled. She compared it to what she imagines being kidnapped feels like, feeling scared, shocked, vulnerable, uncertain of where you're headed. At this point, she's on one bed and I'm on the other facing each other. As she's crying and sharing her experience, we hear a chime from a bell coming from behind her. She leapt onto me in a fraction of a second. I got up to try to see if it was something that could have just fallen or maybe moved. Again, nothing. As I'm walking back, we hear it again, and this time a bit fainter and from a lower point, somewhere closer to the wall facing the bedheads. It's now 5.50 a.m. We had a family member say a prayer and come to sleep in the extra bed. None of us can sleep. That's why it's in parentheses. She keeps trying to throw up to shake the bad feeling that she has in her stomach. We aren't really sensitive to ghosts or spirits. To be honest, we're skeptical of the paranormal. I'd love to dismiss this as sleep paralysis, but this was more than just not being able to move. She's literally sick now, and the bells. Also, it's... 3.26 a.m., or also the 
3, 26 a.m. thing somehow stands out to me. I feel like it's somehow important. Does anyone have any insight into what this could mean? My best friend is convinced that I'm possessed, and I'm afraid he might be bright. I've grown up very religious. I consider myself a Christian and strong in my faith. I also believe in a very powerful spiritual energy in the world, one that isn't exactly spoken about in the Bible, but I believe it to be true. I'm 19 years old and I've struggled with insomnia, severe depression, and anxiety since I was very young. By the age of 8 years old, I believed it was just normal for every little kid to want to kill themselves. It was just another one of those things that kids aren't supposed to talk about. I often had terrible nightmares and have placed them in a place I affectionately call them the vault. The vault is a coping mechanism of mine that I've always had. I also have PTSD from a variety of events, but I didn't know about some of them until I underwent hypnotherapy, which was quite a shock. This vault will be important later. I've recently been having a very strange feeling, like I'm in a trance, like I suddenly gained consciousness in the middle of a common pastime or activity or a feeling of deja vu or a memory that never happened. One of these occurrences I remember very vividly dying. I don't remember how, but I remember the actual death, what it felt like. Then nothing. Like, literally nothing. Then the next thing I know, I'm trucking along a hiking trail. I feel like the death occurrence is somewhere in the vault. Next, we have my best friend. He's another strong Christian, and he has a hypnosis, or excuse me, and he has a hypothesis that there's something in me causing my depression. I often get these thoughts, and I don't call them voices because they're not audible, but they are certainly not my main conscious. They often take control of my train of thought. My train of thought often goes like this. What a beautiful day. Some days aren't that great, though. I should off myself. That's just the default, out of the blue kill yourself. Ten years of this and it's more of an annoyance than anything. My therapists and psychiatrists have all said that my depression is because of a chemical imbalance in my brain. The same reason I have insomnia, but none of them have really told me anything about these thoughts, nor could they explain them. The Bible gives Christians the authority to drive out demons. The other day my friend and I were driving we started talking about this, and he said, I'm going to try something. And he put a hand on me, and he said, In the name of Jesus Christ, get out of my friend. I expected to feel nothing. I haven't told him this, but I felt an incredible sense of humor, anger, and disgust. Just an absolute swelling urge to mock him and the name of Christ. I resisted. Next thing I know, it's gone, and I feel normal again. I also have involuntary movement. I don't have Tourette's or neurological disorder, but my body just twitches, jerks, or shakes at random. Most commonly, when I'm driving or in church. Sorry for going on for so long. I know this was a bit of a mess, but honestly, I'm quite scared. Visited by my guardian angel in a dream. So it's April 2020. I'd recently fractured my leg and I had to keep it immobilized in my bed as it healed. A friend of mine's father had contracted COVID and was being kept in ICU, the intensive care unit. They were in critical condition. He was deeply concerned for his father's well being, as the staff had said the chances of pulling through were slim. He and his mother would cry, expecting to hear the worst as his father's respiratory function was declining. My friend informed me of the situation one evening, and I was too worried on my friend's behalf. 
I then went to sleep. I should preface this by saying I'm no stranger to vivid dreams, at least pre-pandemic and during lockdown. But nowadays, they are few and far in between. In my dream, I was in my room, but there was no light or color. I could still see the objects in my room, but everything was in black and white. Sort of like I had infrared vision. I quickly noted someone sitting at the edge of my bed. It was a Caucasian man in his mid-thirties, with what looked like blonde hair wearing a gray pinstripe suit. I felt a calming presence emanating from him and he smiled at me. I then sat up from my side of the bed, at which point the man spoke. Now, I'm from South Asia, and it's not often you see Caucasian people speaking my mother tongue, but what he said to me still sticks with me today. He gave me a simple instruction. Pray. Upon finishing speaking, he placed his hand on my forehead and gently pushed my head back onto my pillow. I instantly jolted back from my bed and took note of the time. It was 4 a.m. on the dot on my alarm clock. I didn't recognize the name of the person the man was referring to when he was telling me to pray. But given the fact that I am religious, I decided to pray for this person regardless. A few days later, my family informed me that my father's friend had made a rapid recovery and has now been discharged from the hospital. I told my mother about the experience, and upon mention of the name, she had a look of shock on her face. The name was what my father's, or my friend's father, was known by in his childhood. To this day, I'm convinced that the man I saw in my dreams was my guardian angel, or at least an angel of sorts, who wanted me to pray on my friend's father's behalf. I haven't had any subsequent experiences of the sort, but I suppose it's comforting to know that there's somebody watching over me. I used to see things, but the scariest one I think of often. When I was younger, I used to be very in tune with my ability to see beyond the living. For example, my mother had an aunt who I had met one time. She was at my grandparents' new house leaning against the support column on the front porch watching me play in the front yard. She had a very warm, white and inviting smile. I vividly remember her outfit being a white t-shirt that was tucked into her waist-height pants and all white shoes. She stood out, or sorry, what stood out most was her golden cross necklace. She waved to me and I waved at her back. A few weeks ago, my mom was looking through family albums and she showed me a photo of my great aunt. I told her I remembered her and I had met her before when I was about seven years old. My mom was taken aback because come to find out, her aunt had died in May of 1996, two months before I was born. The one thing I saw as a child will forever haunt me wonder what it was. I want to say I was about four or five. It's very blurry to me. I was born with a medical condition where my bladder was a lot smaller than children my age, so I had issues with bedwetting. One night my dad told me to go get my nighttime pull-up on and get ready for bed. My room was dark and I walked in and I felt this terrible feeling of something wrong. I walked across my room to my dresser to get my pull-up, and I heard a faint little whisper. I have no idea how to describe this whisper other than to say it sounded like a starfish in the aquamarine movie with Sarah Paxton. It was whispering mean, hurtful comments to me. The comments were so mean that I ran out of my room crying, told my dad, and he of course didn't believe me, and told me it was just my imagination. So I went back to my room and looked in my closet. There in the bottom of my closet were a pair of eyes. They were green and yellow. I called my dad to my room to show him, and as he came in, he said he didn't see anything. They're right there, Daddy. Then the eyes started mocking me in a whispering tone. They're right here, Daddy. Stop mocking me. Stop mocking me. Daddy, they won't stop. Daddy, they won't stop. Once again, he told me that it was my imagination. 
I slept with my mom and dad that night. They were back again the next night. I told my dad and he said it was impossible because he flushed the eyes down the toilet after I went to bed. They were still there though and very much real. I ended up ignoring them because I noticed they enjoyed getting a rise out of me. And eventually I stopped seeing them. Other strange things would happen in that house, but that by far is the one that stuck out to me the most. The scariest moment of my life. So back in 2013, 2014, I basically lived by myself. I was 14 at the time. Both parents were alcoholics. Dad was on the other side of town with a one-bedroom apartment, and my mom was always with her boyfriend. That being said, most of the time I'd have a friend come sleep over with me since I don't do well being alone at night. It just always made me feel uneasy. This particular house that we moved into, we'd been living there about four months. My brother and mom went together on the lease, but he ended up missing his fiance, ultimately decided to just help mom pay half the rent and come and go as he needed to. He was a night shift nurse and his schedule was all over the place. Anyway, on to the interesting part. My friend, let's just call her Mandy for the sake of the story, lived in my neighborhood, which made it easier for her to come and stay. We'd take turns at each other's houses. One night, Mandy and I were doing some hood rat shit. Literally not even hood rat, the worst, and... I didn't really stay out, and I smoked cigarettes. But anyway, we were at her neighborhood park hanging out with my boyfriend at the time, Alan, and some dude she wanted to hook up with which he did in the park bathroom on the floor while I awkwardly sat on the bleachers three feet away from Alan because we had only been dating for two months. After she did her deed, we walked back to my house. Probably about a 30 to 45 minute walk, so we didn't get there until about 3 a.m. My brother was working that night, so we decided we'd take over his bed instead of my shitty-ass futon that would flip if more than one person was on it. Mandy and I were laying there and I heard her whisper something. I looked over at her and she said, What? Her eyes were wide. She said, I didn't say anything, you just whispered in my ear and freaked me out. I started laughing because for some reason, that's my reaction to situations that scare me. Mandy, I swear to God I didn't whisper in your ear, you're just trying to freak me out, dude. It's not funny. She jumped up and grabbed her charger and her phone and started saying that she was really scared by that and if we could switch rooms. So we get our shit and go to my mom's room across the hall. She plugs her phone in and starts calling her mutual friend MJ. She starts telling MJ how freaked out she was by what happened. And this next part is what made my sh- basically just made me shit my pants. As she's explaining the story to MJ, we hear footsteps that sounded like heavy work boots. And we had hardwood floors in that house, so you could definitely hear it more pronounced. The footsteps started at the far end of the hallway and made their way to my mom's door. Mandy and I were so scared we couldn't even talk, we just looked at each other and then looked at my mom's door waiting for someone to start banging on it or open it. Tried to rationalize and tell myself it was my brother because he always wore those dance coats, even if he wasn't working. And for anybody who doesn't know what dance coats are, they're basically clogs. I peeked out of the blinds since my mom's window was right in front of the driveway and his car wasn't out there. We hear two more steps. Kind of sounded like it went to my brother's room. I told Mandy we probably needed to call 911 since someone was in my house. Then it clicked. I had triple checked the back door and the front door to make sure they were locked. All the windows and the screen door. The screen door was metal and it had a loose panel on the bottom so it was pretty loud when anyone opened it. It clicked and I didn't hear the screen door. The squeaky front door or the back door. And after about 10 or 15 minutes we get the courage to go up and look. Nothing out of the ordinary and every door and window was definitely locked. I 
can't describe the fear I felt that night, not knowing if someone's just about to burst your door open and murder you or your friend. Shit was terrifying. Ever since that night, Mandy refused to come back. I can't say I don't blame her. That's the end of the stories tonight. As usual, see ya.